Good morning. Welcome to Tuesday on the AM show. You know how we do it. No explanations. We're going to give you the finest bit that you can get anywhere across this country on television. Welcome aboard. We start with our news review and convener of uh, Fix the Country Movement, Oliver Bakavomo, will be joining us this morning as usual as we have our uh, no holds barred discussions on many things, including Ghana's economy, one of the topical matters we're going to be delving into in our big stories. Now today, we bring you a comparative analysis on Moody's and Fitch's ratings, those creditworthiness uh, rating institutions. Now, uh, we'll also be talking about Parliament's resumption to discuss the e-levy and other government uh, business. How about the U-tax strike? We'll find out about the role of Parliament in resolving the impasse. Mind you, UTAG failed to attend that confab yesterday planned by the NLC. I guess uh, for these discussions, Al Hassan Suini, Member of Parliament, Tamale North, and Dr. Dixon uh, Adumakukisi, Member of Parliament for Anya Soto. Both of them will join us on that leg of the conversation. But moving forward, when it comes to the UTAG strike, uh, we're going to be interacting with the Vice Chancellor of the University for Health and Allied Sciences as he talks about the way forward in terms of the industrial action. We'll also interact uh, on the University Teachers Association of Ghana, which has been on strike for more than three weeks, with the lecturers protesting poor conditions of service uh, and other allowances due them. We know the NLC tried to get them back to the classrooms, but its attempts have not yielded any results. Today, we host Professor John Japon on the AM show. He is Vice Chancellor of the University for Health and Allied Sciences. We have a whole lot more coming your way in terms of sports, in terms of our news review. You don't want to miss that one. So stay with us. But right now, we bring you AM News with yours truly. We'll be right back. Welcome to the AM News. Let's start uh, with the NDC, the Opposition National Democratic Congress, which has joined uh, forces with some civil society organizations and political parties to stage the Yintia demonstration against the introduction of the e-levy. Now, according to the NDC, the Coalition of Concerned Ghanaians demonstration will also focus on the general hardship in the country, including the industrial action by university lecturers and government's failure to pay allowances to NAPCO recruits. Quissy Parker Wilson, my colleague, has the rest of the story. The party has scheduled Thursday. February 2022 to protest against the government. Some civil society organizations, including Justice for Ghana, ASEPA, as well as the Coalition of Consent Tertiary Students, were among the groups backing the NDC in its quest to march against the introduction of the e levy and what they call the general hardship in the country. George Opariado is national youth organizer of the NDC. Young people have lost hope in our republic, and rightly so, due to the recklessness of the Kufuado Mahmoudou Baumia administration. Ladies and gentlemen, on Thursday, February 3rd, 2022, the National Youth Wing of the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, notified the police to stage a demonstration, dubbed the Yentia demonstration, on Thursday, February 10th, 2022 in Accra as the beginning of a nationwide protest and picketing across the breadth of this country. The rationale behind the demonstration is to, amongst other things, one, give backings to the members of the minority group in parliament who are fighting at the peril of their lives to stop the Kufuado Mahmoudou Baumia administration from foisting its unpopular e levy tax down the throats of the ordinary Ghanaian. Two, demand that the pain of university students at the mercy of the youth tax strike comes to an end. Three, the gratuities of NAPCO trainees and other outstanding areas owed young people, from teacher trainees to nursing trainees and any other young person who works for this country and has not been paid what is due, that government sees to it that all those people are paid immediately. Three, the weak city and how Mahmoud Baumia and his administration can arrest it and make it work again. He also asked government to make public funds expended on the recent town hall meetings, describing it as a wasteful expenditure. 
The president and his spokespersons can do better by giving concrete reasons. And they should also tell us how much they are spending on their town halls. Because the amount of money they are spending on their town hall meetings, I am very sure that by the time they are done, they would have spent more than the six billion that they intend to recover from the E levy. It is a wasteful expenditure, and they should desist from embarking on those useless town hall meetings they are undertaking. The concerned tertiary student addressing the media asked government to desist from using the National Labor Commission to sabotage the university lecturers. The students also served notice of their planned demonstration against government failure to address concerns of the striking university lecturers. UTAG on Monday, 10th January 2022, officially embarked on this indefinite strike and it's been several days and we've been in the fifth week Yet still, these lecturers have decided not to return to the classrooms. We believe that government shouldn't use the National Labor Commission as a bully referee to sabotage our lecturers. We've all realized that the ruling government has been so insensitive about this situation. And there is an Akan adage that says that when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. We want to tell both UTAC and government that students are suffering. Medical students are suffering. Business administration students are suffering. Nursing students are suffering. International students are suffering. Agriculture students are suffering. IT students are suffering. And even the psychology students that are to place us in a stable mentality are even so well on our next story senior presidential advisor yao safamafo is asking for what he describes as a code of conduct for religious groups he believes such an act will help reduce the work on government as religious leaders will be assisting governments in its work he was speaking at a ceremony to honor the head pastor of the Royal House Chapel Sam Crunchy Ankara with a US presidential lifetime achievement award for his humanitarian acts. There's more in this report put together by Hannah Odami. For years, the Royal House Chapel, through its founder, Apostle General Sam Crunchy Ankara, had been involved in acts which assist vulnerable persons achieve their goals. Prisoners who come out have been helped to reintegrate in society through the church's compassion program. I was really much of a gangster. I ended up in, in Sawan prison with a sentence of 11 years on my head. I was in the library just doing some studies and I had a voice. The voice was very different from all the other men of God who had come there. This, you could tell that this guy meant business to bring some people out of prison. Persons who were either dropouts or had no money to get educated were helped to get back to school. I just heard that there is a scholarship foundation in the church. So we, I, I walked up to Mama Rita one day and then just spoke to her about it. So that very year, Daddy and Mommy, out of their pocket, sponsored my fees to St. Augustine's College. These acts by the church in Ghana have been replicated in other countries, including the USA and Jamaica. This was why Apostle General was selected for the U.S. President's Life Achievement Award. You are helping discover and deliver solutions to the challenges we face. Solutions that we need now more than ever. Receiving the award, Apostle Sam Kranchiankra, who pledged to continue helping people, also called on government to cut down expenditure in the public sector. If our politicians will place at their heart the first and foremost, the desire to see this nation move forward, that all of us as citizens of this nation will have a pickable share of the national cake, show the example by cutting national expenditure. They, they, must, they must punish themselves a little bit. And what we see is that expenditure is being cut down if they call upon us to pay taxes, whatever they ask us to pay. 
we shall pay with gladness and willingness because we all know that we all suffer to gain. Senior Minister Yao Osafomafu, who was the special guest of honor, tagged Christians to rise up to that role of aiding government in its wake. We need to have what I call self-discipline, self-examination, so that we examine among ourselves, we have a code of conduct in Christendom that will perhaps reduce the work of government. Because if people are straightened, stealing will go down. People are straightened. Many of the bad social things we see and hear will be eliminated. And I think we need spiritual leaders like Most Reverend Kranchenkra to do self-purging among the Christendom, to take an extra leadership role in the Christendom so that we correct a lot of the ills of the land. Also at the ceremony was the Greater Accra Regional Minister, Henry Corte, who asked for support in the ministry's campaign dubbed Operation Clean Your Frontage. I want to humbly plead with the Most Reverend that we have embarked on what I call Operation Clean Your Frontage. And uh, I want to hand over this area and the Kanishi area to the Most Reverend. to make him one of our ambassadors to appreciate clean your frontage. Perhaps maybe from today he could send a communique to all his branches around Greater Accra to ensure that he help with awareness creation, sensitization, and for that matter, helping people to keep their environment clean. Reverend Kranchiankra pledged his support for the campaign and also prayed for all government officials. Give him wisdom and give him favor that the president will take his counsel in the name of Jesus. For Joy News, I am Hannah Odami. Well, the National Service Scheme has partnered Canadian firm I Am Worth It to train some top management members. Regional directors and personnel with soft skills that would aid their personal uh, growth. This is in line with the scheme's new policy of creating permanent employment for service personnel and equipping others with needed skills to create their own companies. There's more in the following report. The two-day workshop, which was on the theme, Deployment for Employment, the new NSS approach to development, was geared towards providing the needed skills to personnel of the scheme. The National Service Scheme partnered Canadian-based I Am Worth It project to offer management of the scheme with the skills and knowledge to develop ways to make its new vision sustainable, especially to imbibe in personnel adequate skills to be readily employable. He is lead consultant and CEO of the I Am Worth It project, Tammy Shega. We met them and... It just so happens the day before we came in they were having a meeting and it was suggested that what was needed was soft skills training. And the very next day I showed up talking about soft skills, how to communicate, how to lead, how to deal with difficult uh, people, how to manage time, how to rise to personal excellence. and. It was just a natural fit. And so for me, when I want to partner, I want to show those potential partners what we do. And that's what we're doing here today. In a speech read on his behalf, the Education Minister, Dr. Yao Osei Educhim, commended the Executive Director and Management of NSS for repositioning the scheme in a short term to have a workforce that is competent, well-resourced, dedicated and committed to the cause of the vision to achieve greater heights focused on deploying graduates who have completed various programs from accredited tertiary institutions. However, at the onset of the new administration, a new outlook in terms of introducing sound models aimed at equipping personnel with the relevant skills and creating jobs which in the final analysis is expected to put the national service personnel in the right footing. 
Today, the scheme can boast of many, many, many programs. Meanwhile, the executive director of the scheme, Osei Etibe Enchi, reckoned that it has become necessary to permanently employ some of its personnel and ensure that the rest have the required employable skills and experiences ready for the world of work. We have done a lot, but now we need to behave like Paul in the, Baptist, in the Bible. What did he say? He said, all the things that I've done, all the things that I've achieved, I put it behind, then look forward. So now we need to look forward to brace ourselves up for the various challenges. And what are the challenges? Now we need to make sure that the national service personnel that are leaving our door, because the question is, we are the entrance. They entered through our door before they are ushered into the place of work. And when they are done, they come and bid us farewell. So when they are bidding us farewell, where are they going? This is the question we want to address now. The scheme hopes to replicate this training in other parts of the country. Now in our next story, the Bono East Regional Minister, Kwesi Edujan, has charged leadership of the Progressive Cashew Association of Ghana to put in place measures capable of implementing the minimum price for the sale of cashew, as announced by the Tree Crop Development Authority, to restore trust in the cashew sector. The minister made this call while addressing participants at the association's maiden conference held in the Tichingman municipality. Correspondent Anna Sabit reports. The cashew industry is increasingly becoming one of the most important agricultural sectors in Ghana, with the sector contributing significantly to economic growth, particularly job creation and poverty reduction. However, the pricing of the commodity continued to be an issue of contention amongst farmers, buyers and processors until the intervention of the Tree Crop Development Authority which has pegged the pricing of the commodity to a minimum of 5 Ghana cities per kilo. Speaking at the maiden annual national conference of the Progressive Cashew Association of Ghana, Bono East Regional Minister Kwesi Edujan charged the leadership of the association to put in place measures capable of ensuring that the minimum price tag as introduced by the Tree Crop Development Authority is fully implemented. I urge the leadership of this association to work hard in promoting proper coordination among the various actors of the association to put the interests of both members and the sector above their own individual interests. I will also encourage you to put measures in place to ensure the implementation of the minimum price for the sale of cash. The minimum price will motivate farmers to increase production. It will protect the interests of local processes and will also foster transparency and trust among value chain actors and ultimately develop the cashew sector for us all. Chief Executive Officer of the Tree Crop Development Authority and former Deputy Minister of Agriculture, Williams Ajepon Kwetu, noted that the new cashew production regulation, when implemented, would restrict non-authorized cashew sellers from doing so and establish sanity to the sector. Now you see many people going around having cashew uh, seedlings and then going out with their bell on it selling cashew seedlings. Very soon it will be a thing of the past. Very, very soon nobody will be able to go out there and just pull a, a bell on cashew seedlings and be going around more cashew seedlings or more cashew seedlings. Or. Without authorization, you cannot do that. And you are found to do that and you have no justification. Will be arrested. Let's turn our gaze now to the whole municipal assembly, which is determined to protect the environmentally friendly status of the municipality, which has won many accolades. The assembly wants to prosecute persons who engage in unsanitary activities and set fire to bushes in the municipality. The MCE Divine Boson has said the assembly would also liaise with security services to track and arrest perpetrators, arraign and ensure they are punished accordingly.
the newly installed Dutofia of Taviope Aviope, Togbe Agba Aholu the Third, is a health practitioner. He hopes to contribute his quota to restore the Taviope traditional areas past glory and called for a peaceful coexistence. Mina Beni Adezo Ab America Le Taviope. We must be united and work towards the common good of Taviope. We need development. Our neighbors should not be seen as our enemies, but people we can unite with to develop the Taviope, Ziavi, Klepe, Mache, and Lume Enclave. The Home Municipal Chief Executive, Divine Borson, lamented activities of environmental degradation. Who has been identified as the cleanest city in Ghana? UNESCO also described Ho as the oxygen city, which means that you will live long when living in Ho. But the unwarranted burning of bushes threatens the vegetation of Ho. And with that, we wrap AM News. But coming up, we have, of course, the news review. Do stay for that. Well, thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, this is the news review, and we do it together with convener of Fix the Country uh, movement, Oliver Baka Vomawo. I see you already, Oliver. Good morning to you. I always say good morning using my time, but I guess you don't mind, do you? Uh, you'd have to un unmute, Oliver. You are committing one of the cardinal sins. Of <laughs> the elbow is one of the cardinal sins. Good morning. How are you doing? Uh, I, I still can't hear you, Oliver. Can't hear me. Uh, okay, it's better now. Ah, okay, you can hear me now. I can hear you now. I can hear oh, you goodness. now. Okay. Um, well, you, let me let me let me still repeat what I've been trying to say for the past so many minutes. I'm saying no. I'm I'm I'm, I'm fine with it. Good morning. I hope you are well. I am well. I hope you are too. You 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 look a little. I don't know whether it's uh, tired. Uh, it's been a long day. So yes. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long day, but I am fine. Right. But good to have you. Good to have you on board. Let's dig right into it. And uh, before we get into the papers, I'd like us to look at a few things that have uh, been developing. So transport fares, uh, uh, some of those in the sector uh, are seeking to review them upwards by 30%. Of course, that is on the uh, back of price hikes when it comes to fuel. And we've also heard from Kwekwa Jumandia, uh, who is uh, CEO of the oil marketing companies. And he is projecting that by March, we would hit eight CDs and above per liter of, uh, you know, fuel products. Um, th this, I, I believe, or I mean, you can foresee, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know this, or an economist, will make the economic straits of the ordinary Ghanaian even worse. Uh, do you think it's high time government started doing something about our fuel price fluctuations? Um, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it really does give meaning to breaking the eight, doesn't it? Um, I think I think the question about trying to stabilize, you know, fuel pricing is not something that we haven't tried to tackle before. 
uh, there is the is the whole idea behind you know the the, the stabilization levy that was put on, on on the pricing. The problem, however, is that when the idea was necessarily to put something in place so that when there were these movements in terms of you know global pricing on, on on fuel, government then will use the stabilization levy to reduce to subsidize it. You know, meaning that we had already committed to raise some revenue on that. Unfortunately, in the past, it has been steeped in dishonesty where the state puts in place the levy and when prices started to run to to rise it wasn't kicking in to reduce and and, and reduce the shock on, on consumers locally and so it's it's unclear to me how much commitment there is in, in, in keeping that stabilization mechanism working in a way that is honest and true and and led by truth uh, when it has happened in the past there's not been any remedy for citizens for instance to seek to force the government to respect we, you know, prior commitments that, that were made. In fact, there was no mechanism in place that required the government to, to do this and to, in fact, stabilize prices. It was, it was political talk. And if you, if you know anything about our republic, political talk, you, you put very little faith in it. Now, mm. we are this is an economy which is deeply tied into, into the, you know, into, into the up and downs of, of, the, of the poor pricing. This is particularly because we have very little diversified energy sources. And even in terms of electricity generate, generation, uh, unfortunately, with the, you know, the, the car power ship and others, we are continuing to re rely on those, on, on those fuel and to be able to pack, to be able to power various sectors of our economy. So I, I'm, I'm afraid to say that we've gotten to a high degree of such reliance on, on Petroleum products that it's, I don't know how much stabilization we are going to, going to be able to put in now for the immediate time to be able to shock, absorb before, you know, we, we hit crazy by March and towards the middle uh, of the, of the month, uh, of the year. Right. But something has to be done immediately and something needs to be done for the long term. Mm. And I think that the stabilization, the stabilization arrangement, which is really honest, that is put on a, on a legislative right. framework. That protects Ghanaians and, and stops them from the government, you know, changing his mind mid course might be might be helpful. Well, only time will tell whether we're, we're able to uh, do that. But of course, uh, we don't want the aid to be broken in that infamous way. We maybe in a different way, but not this way. But uh, sticking to money matters and uh, other matters of economic concern. Uh, I'm sure you followed the country representative for the World Bank in recent times, Pierre Laporte who's been talking about the fact that we're giving too many tax exemptions and all of that. And uh, we've heard our own president in one of his State of the Nation addresses talk about the fact that we could get to the point in about 16 years where about half of our GDP is going into these tax exemptions. But uh, the World Bank has also been called upon to investigate how the money they've given us, we've executed or expended them in terms of dealing with COVID-19. We're talking about... $430 million, some say up to $560 million. And the question is, if we used this on COVID-19, how are we repaying for water and electricity that we, we were supposed to have got gratis for free, uh, for example, and all of that? The minority is also pushing for further information on, on this. Uh, from what you know about, I mean, the workings of the World Bank and COVID-19 and all of that, what would be your quick reaction to this? Especially, uh, uh, Oliver, let me add, as the World Bank has also said that they are going to investigate the use of the cash. And if it doesn't fall in line with what it was supposed to be used for, they will seek a refund. Um. I think that in itself will be a, a rare move by the World Bank uh, in, in seeking for a, a member state to, to refund money back uh, to the chest of the World Bank. I don't think it has happened to the, to the best of my knowledge before. Uh. But generally, though, I mean, I think the, the you know, global international institutions like the World Bank do thrive on some level of, of institutional accountability in terms of funding that is released generally. From the times past, they've stayed more on the higher level and rather than the granular level. Right. You know, uh, and even in terms of when they have asked for certain, you know, funds to be committed to specific projects. Now, in this particular case, I don't know to what extent and what level of scrutiny they will be asking for 
And even in fact, whether or not this, the kind of audit that will be done is a value for money audit. Not only a value for money audit, but also a, a project scope audit. So for instance, if COVID-19 funds uh, were used to say support some football match in some in, in Chebi, let's say, for instance, are they going to say this falls out of scope? And so we're going to ask for a refund in that regard. Um, I, 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 because there's very little practice and experience here, I'm, I'll be surprised to, to see what is done. But it speaks more generally to, to one of the problems we've had with, with, with government, and in particular, this government is blown, is blown in out of proportion, which is the level of profligacy, but also the, the absurd unaccountability that goes with it. But written in that is also some, I, I suppose, an entitlement syndrome. There's certainly a level of entitlement to our money, entitlement to other people's money, and spending it recklessly without with very little apology. So these are questions that we're going to be monitoring, I suppose, all of us together in the coming months. Now, on the question of tax exemption, I, you know, it's one of the murky areas that you honestly do not understand under what framework we are seeking and obtaining tax exemptions for companies. Uh, over and over again, you know, such that the vast majority of taxes is, made, is borne by local industries and businesses created by Ghanaian, and they bear the, the brunt of it. And then we admit various companies or various, you know, entrepreneurial interests from, from Western countries, and they come in to compete with our businessmen. And then we give them tax exemptions that in the long term end up hurting local competition and then our businesses fold up. So this is something which I think the government is now saying that they're going to introduce some tax exemption, you know, law to kind of sanitize the system. My preference is that for a government which is completely cash strapped as to this, that we write off or we cancel tax exemptions for at least the next 10 years. That is not part of the Ghanaian vocabulary and people cannot, you know, give $1 million, pay $1 million to a politician and in exchange get $550 million or or, you know, 700 million in, in, in tax exemption. Mm. I think it's a, it's a funnel for corruption and we need to deal with it. Right. Um, the Daily Graphic newspaper, 80 block schools upgraded benefit from additional infrastructure. And the government has decided to add some new infrastructural interventions at eight of the existing community day senior high schools, uh, popularly called e-blocks. The interventions are dormitory and administration blocks, bungalows for the headmasters and assistant headmasters, assembly halls, dining halls, and two-bedroom, six-unit staff flats. Then, early warning systems set up against security threats. Uh, those stories on pages 16 and 17 of the paper. Upper East uh, West top FGM cases. That's according to the UNFPA. I'm talking about female genital mutilation. And SIGA to list 11 state entities on stock exchange. On the back page of the Daily Graphic, free surgery for hernia patients in the Western region. And we've seen how this has actually caused uh, the loss of some lives in recent times, people who couldn't get operated on. And 500,000 Ghana City compensation for families of Ijra shooting victims. Um, we know the Economic Fighters League has been talking about this in terms of justice for Kaka Macho. But let's get into the Ghanaian Times newspaper. Government will appeal Moody's credit rating. That's according to the finance ministry. Let's stay here for a while, Oliver, because I'm sure you followed um, how government, the, the, the push and shove, the, 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 the ferocious manner in which they have contested Moody's rating. Only today, lest I forgot, uh, forget, I spotted uh, 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 a sort of release that purportedly, I, we're still investigating, purportedly is from the Africa. Uh, peer review mechanism that is also contesting this. But the fact remains that of the three major uh, economic, or better still, credit worthiness rating agencies, I'm talking about Standard & Poor's, Fitch, and Moody, Ghana hasn't fared too well. Yes, B negative with a stable outlook in some cases, B negative with uh, you know a negative outlook. But with Moody's, it is a CAAA. Now, we're treading in very dangerous territory when it comes to uh, this rating. Do you feel Moody's may have got it wrong? Uh, I mean, from where you sit and, and this um, antagonism uh, towards it, <laughs> what, what do you make you've of it? You've jumped, over, you've jumped over nuggets of stories that, if you don't mind, we need to revisit. Mm. One was the SIGA purporting to enlist on the stock exchange. Right, we can get into SOEs. that. 
The other one is the Indira incidents. For I've, I've continued to remain a, the legal advisor to the Kaka family and the victims of the Indira incident. Right. And then this one as well. So I just give quick thoughts on that if you don't mind. Um, J -j now, just make them a little brief. The first two, the cigar and the okay. Indira bits. So cigar one. Uh, cigar is overlooking companies uh, that have enterprises that haven't turned a profit in a while. Right. In 2020, over five billion was the total accumulative losses that the state-owned enterprises incurred. The last right. time they turned a profit was way back, I think, in 2016, uh, where they had a profit of roughly four, four, 460 million. Mm. But since then, it's been accumulating loss and loss and loss. Right. Nobody has lost their jobs. There's been no attempt to sanitize the system. No, board, no person on the board of directors has been, has been sent to jail, has been prosecuted for, for monumental losses. It's asking me how we want to ship off those losses onto the stock market and, and ask unsuspecting Ghanaians to give their money to companies which are terribly mismanaged. Uh, on Edra, uh, I think that, you know, Edra reflects to me, again, a moral failing of our republic. And even as I continue to provide legal advice to, to these families, uh, I know that there's a long journey ahead. The, the quest to seek true justice, which entails some criminal responsibility on the part of the perpetrators, uh, it's something that the families are committed to and will continue to pursue. Um, I've seen a statement by the Economy Fighters League, which I think it's uh, completely without nuance and, you know, uh, un misinformed or uninformed in this particular case. But that's, an, that's a different alt altogether matter. But I think that we have a long way to go in seeking justice for, for the people, and I, I continue to work with the, with the families towards that end. Now, the ratings, you had asked whether, you know, Moody's got it wrong. Um, it has come to my, my appreciation that the, the finance ministry is seeking and will be seeking a review of some of these ratings. And that the president has gone on, uh, I think before the AU, to, to attack the credibility of these ratings agencies right. and accuse them of some institutional bias against Af Africans. Now, a, a number of African countries have actually suffered, some of them. I mean, to be fair, across the world, but quite a number of African countries. I think especially with the Fitch ratings, or is it S&P, uh, have, have been on the, the, the wrong end of the ratings. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's easy to be on the wrong end of a rating if you mismanage your economy. Right. Now, I have zero interest in defending these ratings agencies. Have you understood the nature, the institutionalized nature of, of international trade and global politics? Right. But in this particular case, I, I think that we have to be a bit more careful and, and scrutinize government's lack of consistency on this. Mm. We've seen them organize a KNK party when they felt that ratings were good. We've seen them issue statements. And actually, the Minister of Information has issued, has done a press conference to congratulate these rating agencies when it's given government what they consider to be favorable reviews in the past. Mm. By the same metrics, now they've reviewed the gravity of our economic situation, which is not unknown to all of us which in fact is one of the biggest topics of conversations in this country, and determined that we are at a situation whereby, uh, well, by Simon says to say that we are broke, uh, 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 it's not a policy term, and that we are completely broken in terms of how in which we are making financial decisions in this case. Right. So I, I, I think this is an attention-shifting device. It has been the way of, you know, dictators in the past where the domestic problems to create a foreign enemy. And, and divert attention and say, hey, look here instead of there. No, I'm, I still have my eyes on the E-Levy and, and, and government's inability to be honest and, and accountable rather than being distracted by some, uh, you know, conversations around, around Moody's. Because the fact remains, we are in a terrible shape. Debt is spiraling way in, out of control. And in fact, my, my suspicion is that if we do make, fail to make payments in the coming, you know, uh, debts that we need to service, then it means that our situation is even going to be, going to be worse. Mm. I have advised Ghanaians that if they are smart, they will start taking money out of the banks and buying foreign currency to preserve their savings from a government that is mismanaging, mismanaging the economy. We've seen this happen before in countries like Egypt, uh, sorry, in Argentina, where because of spiraling debt and the government being unable to bring it un under control, inflation rose uh, incredibly and, and, and persons lost their pensions and their savings. And I think that we are risking that if we don't take drastic measures.
I'll put these two stories together, though very different, uh, from the Ghanaian Times newspaper and the Daily Guide. The first one has to do, in fact, let me do the Daily Guide newspaper first. Uh, four vendors crushed to death and uh, they lost their lives and uh, several others sustained varying degrees of injury when a truck lost its brakes or you know, had it, its brakes fail and rammed into vehicles in front of it at the Abri Junction in Nsawam uh, yesterday. The truck, which was laden with cement, uh, suffered uh, a loss of its braking system as a result of which the driver lost control, leading to the vehicle crashing into three taxi uh, cabs. And Gori does not suffice to talk about the carnage uh, that this has resulted in. The other story I want you to look at quickly, uh, putting them side by side, it's on page 16 of the Ghanaian Times newspaper. It says, $4 million SNIT-funded children's library left unused. Now, Oliver, uh, you don't have the resources, and the ones you have to, uh, you're not putting to the best of use. I singled out this bid because I have personally been to this uh, place years back. And we spoke about this self-same matter. And here we are in 2022, and the status quo remains. Uh, an estimated $4 million uh, pumped into this and nothing to show for it. Uh, the project was built as part of SNIT's 50th anniversary celebration. And it's yet to be furnished. Uh, furnished. That, that those are some details for you. Oliver, over to you. Um, the accident one is very, yeah, Gory doesn't even cut it, right? Like, uh, it always reminds me of a, some movie I watched, which is about, uh, I think, a thousand ways to die in the wild, wild west. Mm. Whereas, like, in, in, in Ghana, like, the, the number of ways in which people lose their lives is amazing. Like, we're talking about, I remember when we're talking, when we're struggling all with, how to better pronounce whether it's a PAT or a PAT or all that. And to think that people died were literally bombed out of the community in Ghana. Hmm. In that same way, accidents that happened on our roads claimed comparable lives as well. And that's got very little media coverage. Yeah. The, the ways in which we, we find ingenuity in dying in this republic shows me the hmm. kind of value we place on, on lives in this country. Uh, <laughs> abandoned, abandoned government projects. Listen, first the country is actually in the, in the middle of trying to mobilize homeless communities to occupy the Saglemen housing project. And this we continue, we consider to be our responsibility under Article 41 of the 1992 Constitution right. to protect government properties and also prevent uh, mis misuse and, not, and, 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 and preserving the constitutional injunction that governments must continue past projects. This is the conquer of our, of our nation. Right. We are the only country in the world that has put in in its own constitution, a requirement that governments must continue past projects. Do you know how, how much it must take to put that in the national document? So I don't know what kind of sickness it is that spends 200, over $200 million, loans it, in fact, where we are continuing to accrue debt on, because we haven't started even repaying it, and building homes at Saglime, and leaving them to the elements that now they are cracking and rotting. Uh, the, all the, the power plants there, or the copper wires have been stolen. There's a bus which has been abandoned on site. The polytanks have now been, because of the exposure to sun, now are in a very fragile state. Uh, all the finishing that were, fit, fit, fittings that were done on the building are now completely in ruins. But $200 million. So I, I don't understand how, you know, we have a state that has very little incentive to protect public property. And we, the people themselves, sit down, go there, like look at them and say, oh, oh boy, this is so bad. And then we walk on, 10 years down the line, we come back and it's the same thing. Right. It's happened under the Rawlings administration, the Kufu administration, even built houses up north and left them to rot in the bushes. So I don't understand how our citizens can, can, can sanitize the system without taking, you know, out of the box measures and thinking out of the box against a state that really doesn't care. It doesn't hit their pockets. They are not criminally or civilly liable for any of these things. So Nkosi Dabeng. Nkosi Dabeng. Interesting thoughts. We're wrapping the conversation, uh, the review, I should say, on pages 10 and 11 of the Ghanaian Times uh, newspaper, 11 million COVID-19 vaccine doses am administered nationwide. COVID-19 cases shoot up by 165. And according to Amadako, uh, Ellen Amadako of the NPP, 
Uh, a member of their communications team, politics is drowning the substance of the e-levy. My final thought to you, uh, I'm hoping you can address in some 40 seconds. UTAG decided not to attend uh, the convocation or confab with the NLC and the employer government. Your quick reaction to that. Uh, the NLC has become an extension of the government, uh, an extension that allows it to always do the government line. Uh, I think that any institution that is in an industrial action that respects the NLC or even gives them any credence, it's, it's, it's not serious about what he wants to do. I think what, what UTAC has done is appropriate and recognizes their own power as, a, as an organized leader. And I do my hats off to them. Oliver, you're always a breath, of, a breath of fresh air. Thank you so much for joining the conversation. And uh, I wish you the very best of today. Thank you, and I appreciate it. All right. And that is a wrap for the news review. Don't you forget, later on the show, we have the Vice Chancellor of the University for Health and Allied Sciences, Professor Japong, joining the conversation. It's going to be about, well, 10 years of UHAS and the impact they've made. We'll also be talking about the UTAG uh, strike and what it means uh, to him. Do stay, though, up next. These are members of parliament, members of Ghana's parliament here. Now the third fight in the first year of the eighth parliament. So this is the situation here on the 20th of December, 2021. Well, I must also condemn it uh, because it's shameful. It's a dent on the image of Ghana's parliament to us in leadership that is occurring at our time. And we should bow down our heads in shame. It's a dent on the parliament of Ghana and indeed, a mortal wound on Ghana's democracy. We got off to a bumpy start January 7th. And I saw some leaders attacking <laughs> ballot boxes. Some in leadership doing that. You saw. You saw some in the extended leadership booting down pulling boots. You saw that. And you saw somebody also snatch ballot box, uh, ballots and attempt to run away with it. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a shameful incident that day, what happened. And then December, these rowdy scenes, fisticuffs. And I saw some members, you know, attempt to slap their own colleagues. And he took pride in that. And such people, when it comes to discourse in the plenary, they are found wanting. Do you see them? And he thinks that he must exhibit bravado. Is it the display of bravado or brawn or brain in parliament? In parliament, it's about brain power, not the display of brawn. Professor Ransford Jampo, a political scientist, argues it's okay for MPs to fight. Listen to me, a, every, a hung parliament has got its own features. One of the key distinguishing features of every hung parliament is its susceptibility of degenerating into political fisticuffs. It is there. That is its nature. Okay, every hung parliament can degenerate into physical fight. It is there. But you see, in politics, countries that are determined to climb higher the ladder of democratic progression copy the best practices. You understand? So my point is that even though physicals are features of every hung parliament, there are parliaments that are hanged that do not um, show that features. They are mature. And so rather than looking at countries that have fisticuffs because they have hung parliament, let's look at other countries that have tolerance and that are able to dialogue and reach consensus with their hung parliament and copy them. Well, thank you very much for joining the conversation. We get into the big stories for today and we start on the standpoint of the economy. We've had the various rating agencies, the three big ones, uh, Standard & Poor's, Fitch and Moody's give us their ratings. It appears though that uh, government is not 
uh, in agreement with some of the ratings and it feels it is being hard done. In fact, we've seen, we've cited a document purportedly from the African peer review mechanism which also backs that call. But why the, the hasty retreat now that is being beaten by this administration, especially as in the past it has touted these same ratings? We talk about this, we talk about Parliament reconvening, and we talk about the long-standing impasse when it comes to UTAC. The University Students Association of Ghana also threatening a strike uh, on the back of these developments. We get into the issues with our guests this uh, morning. Dr. Dixon Adomaku Kisi is Member of Parliament for Anyasa Utuum. Uh, he represents, should I say, the MPP end or government end? Government. Government, right. Thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you. We also have uh, Aha Sansuini, Member of Parliament, Tamale North, representing the other end, the NDC's end. Right. Okay. I had to state that categorically because, I mean, we all know how uh, these play out. But I'm hoping that I, even as we touch on these matters, it will not be like... Um, Amadako of the MPP said recently, it will not be politics as usual, but we'll get to the bare bones of the matters and address them. After all, it is Ghana we are talking about. So gentlemen, thanks for joining the conversation. Now, we start from that rating by Moody's, a CAA1. What fundamentally, Dr. Dixon, is your problem with the, the, the rating? Especially as in the past, uh, like Oliver Baka Vomao said this morning, you have organized Kenke parties and all of that, celebrating you know, some of these ratings in the past, when they went in your favor. Now, you say, uh, when I was speaking to Honorable John Kuma yesterday, Deputy Finance Minister, that it is propagandist, uh, it is an attempt to you know, paint African countries with a certain brush and all of that. H how did we get to this point? Well, um, thanks for having me here. Uh, before I move into this, my, my heart goes out to the people of Insawa. I think yesterday there was a tragic yeah. incident. Yeah. There, our chief whip uh, manages that constituency. So Four dead, nine injured. Yes, that. he's been he's been hit by that, and and I think travel safety is very important. We we need to take it serious as a country. Now coming back to uh, the economic indicators, I'm I'm of a different thought. I mean, uh, and I've always been like that. Since, since, um, since I've been following these ratings. Um, I'm a student of Warren Buffett, and he says that the score lines are not very important when you are really in the thick of making decisions. And, and why does he say that? Uh, he's a long-term investor, and, and his reasons for not making decisions based on ratings is the fact that when you make managerial decisions that are heavy, uh, in the interim, the rating agencies might not necessarily appreciate the uh, decisions made by management. And right. as such, if you manage your company based on ratings, you're going to be in trouble. And, and rightly so. We had the Enrons that had A-plus ratings and dipped overnight. Mm. There are numerous companies that had very good scores and dipped. And, but, and, but, but and there are, I'm not trying to yeah. curtail your train of thought, but there are exceptions to every norm. And, and the fact that yeah. Enron suffered what it did doesn't not just mean Enron. that the, the, the yeah. ratings are not plausible. No, 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 no. And, and don't get me wrong here. What arguments I'm making is the fact that, listen, uh, we are in a situation where ratings are definitely important. Mm -hmm. However... Ghana's economic uh, trajectory uh, has been hit by a number of things. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the disagreements in Parliament with regards to how government can raise some revenue. And, and I kept saying that, you know what, whether the opposition likes it or not, when we tank, we tank together as a country. Mm -hmm. And so the decisions that the opposition has taken mm -hmm. are going to still impair the whole country in terms of our access to finances. But, but they agree with you on that. In fact, they've been calling recently that, uh, if you look at the latest release from the former president, John Dramani Mahama, he is saying, don't be so stubborn. Listen to their side as well for broader measures that can bring the country out of the doldrum. So that because they know very well that even if they inherit an economy from you, yes. they will be affected. I mean, th th that is what they've been saying. Well, so it's nothing new, is it? Well, if that was the case, then the, I mean, I, I was of the opinion that Listen, government proposes to add revenue through a certain a mechanism. You've shown your disinterest, your uh, dislike for the process. Mm. 
mm. which is the you know ra raising or mobilizing funds through the e levy. Right. Fair enough. Once you've done that, let's be mindful of the fact that if we don't move the process along, these are the kinds of results we're going to get as a nation. Mm. Because right now, uh, Fitch, Moody's, SMP, bank on one key thing: how much revenue government is going to make. And then what's your indebtedness? And, and these are the very core, uh, you know, rationales or reasons where we are, where, you know, why we are where we are. But with that said, let me add a key thing that the investments in education are very difficult to quantify in terms of the real returns. And, and that is a huge chunk, one of the flagship programs that the president has embarked on. Are you talking of and, free SHS? Yes. And, 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 and that... By all means, any country in the world that has embarked on human capital investment right. has suffered uh, some of these consequences. And I think that so be it. In 10 years, we will see the huge benefits to these kinds of investment that the president You've has. technically not answered my question. So when it comes to these ratings, uh, do yeah. you agree with them or disagree? Do you think they got it right? Moody's, for example, with a CAA1 uh, rating for, for Ghana. Mind you, uh, yes, they have tweaked their mechanisms when it comes to the ratings, but it's practically the same Moody's, same institution, same uh, assessment methods. W what has changed? And why are you going after them? No, no, no. I'm not going after them. No, I'm saying my, my, only point, my only point is that when you're making very huge managerial decisions, when you're in the thick of a, a sports game, and you are focused on just looking at the score lines. You miss, you miss out on the opportunity of making your scores. Mm. And, and that is why once we're in government and governing, I think that our priority, our preoccupation, should not be necessarily about the ratings. And, and I've cited many instances where, clearly, when you make managerial decisions based on your ratings, and you know, that, that will not help you mm. for a company mm. or for a country. And Ghana has made a huge sacrifice in the past five years with regards to our human capital, our human potential. And I really think that uh, it's unfortunate. It is not measurable in terms of you know, these uh, indicators. It's not. Okay. And, and, and it, it's not just us. Many countries that had at some point, you know, like the Singaporeans, who at some point had decided that, listen, let's hit hard on our human capital and made sure that they invested in training a lot of skilled workers. During those times, it, you know, they were not rated very well in, in the SMPs, Moody's or Fitch. Mm. But over time, when you know, they started realizing the gains of those investments, the, the ratings became... So that is where we are now. And, and I really think that, unfortunately, I mean, uh, one, at this point in time, our difficulty is trying to show that we can uh, you know, clear our indebtedness appropriately. And, and, and I was always hang on one thing with the e levy. I, I kept saying that in the investment world, when they see that Ghanaians are putting their money where their mouth is, with regards to a lot more people buying into giving a little for our development, that signal alone would have sent short our ratings to AA. You, you understand? And, and unfortunately, that bit of the sale in terms of telling people that, listen, the e levy is a demonstration of our intent and goodwill towards our own development, mm. and, and that has fell on deaf ears, unfortunately. Let, 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 let me bring you in know? Alahassan at, at this point. Do you, do you subscribe to uh, these ratings agencies and what they do? And mind you, we go to them. Um, they have their own, I mean, there are outfits that they assess for free. But we go to them, African countries, we pay close to $500,000, dollars 400 to $500,000 annually just to get them to give us these ratings. Why? Because the ratings also reflect what we can do in terms of our capitalization when we go on the foreign uh, market. Your, your own administration has suffered uh, some of these ratings, whether Bs, fortunately, a lot of the time you found yourself in B territory. But now we're looking at CAA1. And, and some industry watchers are very concerned. We spoke to Professor Lord Mensah, who says, we shouldn't be fighting these institutions. We should rather be looking at doing the right things to ensure that they give us proper ratings. Same corroborated by Dr. Suming and others. Uh, do you feel we are being too, um, we are antagonizing them instead of embracing their reports? Well, um, 
Good morning again to you. Good morning to Doc and to our viewers, especially the very good people of the Tamale North constituency. <laughs> I was listening to Doc, and I was not surprised when he started on the note of blame the opposition. You know, blame the NDC for everything. Even in opposition, we are responsible for the economic hardships. Are you not? Uh, how are we? But, but they say that you left them in a deep hole and they are still trying to claw Ghana out of that hole. That's, that's, that's a shame. I mean, because anybody who looked at the um, forecast of mm. all these institutions, all these institutions, World Bank, Moody's, is aware that the forecast was good for Ghana by the time the NDC was leaving office. Mm. The 8% uh, GDP growth in 2017 was predicted by 2016 by all these institutions. The, 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 the last time we had a discussion on rating agencies, Moody's had rated Ghana uh, B, neg uh, B negative with a yeah. positive outlook. With a stable outlook. Yeah, yeah with a stable outlook. That's and and, and yeah, with a stable outlook. And, and we had a conversation around whether it was good or it was bad. And I recall what Dr. Baumia then said. It was just Ghana was B negative with a stable outlook. The discussion around whether that was a good you know, a, a rate for Ghana to take to the market, was that heated that Dr. Baumia actually told President Muhammad to stop embarrassing himself, quote and unquote, that he should stop embarrassing himself. And, and, and what did President Muhammad say? He was not attacking the rating agencies. He was simply saying that B minus with a stable outlook is not bad. And he said, stop embarrassing yourself. You know, so today when I hear the president and Akufuado say, no, these guys, that is anti-colonial legacy, we must not take it. And then you hear the finance ministry say, no, I mean, we have to challenge them. It is not fair on us. It is propaganda. I, I'm left wondering how to well, react. We, we have the option of doing that. We have the option of challenging. In fact, they, they do these ratings in consonance with, they, they collaborate with us. They speak to our end. Uh, just to ensure that the figures they are putting out are correct. They will talk to our uh, economic management teams. Uh, but in the, in the instance of Moody's, uh, unlike, I think, um, Fitch. Fitch, they have stuck to the C rating. And they are saying it is on the back of certain, of course, the, the, the requisite details they look at. Exactly. I mean, are it, we that. are entitled to challenge if we think that something has gone wrong. But I just find it quite hypocritical, the stance of government especially in relation to the positions they adopted, when we were not even this worse, uh, you know, rated mm. when they were in opposition. I, I just find it, you know, grossly hypocritical. Yeah. And I don't know how to, to react to such double standards coming, coming from them. And I can only agree with one who said this morning on Facebook that when the fundamentals are weak, you argue with rating agencies. That is, that is for me what is happening now. And you see, I cannot agree with President Mahama more when he says this government needs to pipe down, climb down from their high horses and engage. And let us all see together how we can, you know, rise above or out of this ditch that they have put us in. Mm. I mean, this government in 2020 alone had the biggest windfall that you know, Ghana has ever had. Mm. In one year, 33 billion Ghana cities and over. And if I may just give the, give, give the breakdown of that, uh, yeah. 2020 to 2021, per that same right. document you're referencing. Yeah. So a $1 billion concessional facility from the IMF, another $1 billion in SDR allocation, $430 million from the World Bank, which can be stretched to $560 uh, million, $250 million from the Stabilization Fund, $10 billion from the Central Bank, totaling in Ghana City equivalents $33 billion. I'll come back to you on, on, on that. So, 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 that. so when he says that these rating agencies are only looking at how well we are able to you know, raise revenue, it's not correct. Mm. They have seen how we have raised revenue in the last three years. Mm. But they have also seen how we have wasted the revenue that has come But, to but us. they've also seen, for example, how we've not been able to get our e-levy on track. If we had got it on track by October, uh, these ratings definitely wouldn't be what we are seeing because 
uh, they look at forecasts and your ability to repay debts. Now, if we had the e-levy on board, they would be able to factor that in and we wouldn't be getting some of the ratings we are getting. And, and I'm saying this in, in consonance with the fact that your end in parliament has prevented them in government from passing the e-levy. You see, if you had 33 billion in the previous year mm. and you blew it, and we all know how they blew it, the Auditor General report is there mm. to tell us how they blew it. Mm. It is a shame for you to excuse your failings in your inability to pass a levy. That wouldn't have even raised six billion by now. Even though you are expecting six billion from that levy. Six as we nine speak, billion, yes, thereabouts. as we speak, you wouldn't have even raised it by now. Mm. So to say that, oh, if that... But, but, but it's, it's a year-long projection. If, and if, and it's, it's a projection that in the space of the year, they are hoping to get. You can't say that by now. I mean, that wasn't the projection, no, but, 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 to be fair. What I'm, you. No, you, you, then you didn't listen to me. I'm saying that. Yeah. If you blew 33 billion mm. in the previous year, right. and we all know how they blew it, because the Auditor General report is there. That is unfair. It is unfair. To, as, to, 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 to excuse your, weak, your, 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 your deficiencies today right. based on a levy that wouldn't have raised six billion by today. Mm. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying I am unaware that it is a year-long projection, but I'm saying that if you could not manage 33 billion, mm. the rating agencies obviously will wonder how just six billion even if you have it within the year, mm. can make any difference. Can be the, the, the cure. Can be the panacea yeah. to the problems that you are faced with. Could, but then again, it is unfair right. to say that the minority NDC mm. prevented the government from passing it. Is, is that not what you've done? That is not what we have done. What have you the done? Minority, Don't you pride yourself? The minority on NDC mm. has simply opposed the levy with right. the 137 members of parliament. Right. Just in line with the opposition majority of Ghanaians have expressed. Right. The NPP, on the other hand, fortunately, have 137 plus an independent member who caucuses with them. Mm. It is as a result of the inability of the government, the inability of the government, to mobilize the 138 to get it passed. It is not is a, is a the opposition the that has refused right. or the government point, to get it point, passed. Point made it in is, that respect. It is right. another you know, example of the inefficiencies that we speak of. So, so the failure, one, three, their failure to pass the E-Levy is because of it. their inefficiency. It is their failure. Their failure to master numbers it in Parliament. It is their failure. All right. Thank and not the, oh, thank the, not the opposition stance. Doc, how, how did you, and, and let's streamline the conversation mm -hmm. following from what he said. Okay. How did you manage blowing 33 billion Ghana CDs? What do you have to show for it? And, and let's put this into context. The World Bank, for example, Pierre Laporte is saying the $435 million is being investigated, is going to be investigated to find out whether you used it actually to give the sort of COVID-19 relief that as a country we need it. And he even adds that if it is found that you did not use the funds or part of the funds for the right purposes, Ghana would have to you know, dole out a refund, which, which for me is unheard of. But that is where it is inching uh, uh, towards. Uh, how, do you, how do you account for this? You know, um, I've always been very happy with the uh, institution that was created, which is now the, uh, is it uh, GEA, uh, government, uh, what was it? It used to be uh, NBSSI. You know, oh, right, right, go right. government I see, I see agency for, yeah. for entrepreneurial related uh, things. And, and you know, I, I, can, I can only take my mind back to when people were getting text messages uh, where their account had been loaded with about 2,000 Ghana cities. Some got 6,000, some got up to the tune of about 20,000. And, and those were big time reliefs. Mm. And it came when people needed it. Uh, and, and in fact, it became one of the problems within the MPP 
because <laughs> some people thought that it should have been just for quote unquote party faithfuls. But the president did something remarkable. He made sure that that credit facility was available to everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, in some constituencies, we think that we lost because it, it appeared that NDC sympathizers rather got the money more so than the MPP sympathizers. It would be good to look at the list and find out who exactly got what, how much, well, and uh, get into But the, people, people, the people. people did get those funds. In addition, we had a president who took a bold decision to give us a break from paying for water because it was essential to the fight of COVID. Right. And, and, and in hindsight, we might say that that bill ticket was too much. And, and, and assuming that role was a high-risk decision. Mm. I mean, even in the Americas, I don't think we had them telling them that, hey, we'll pay your water bill. It didn't happen anywhere. But, but well, they were given certain reliefs, you know, monetary packages that, that could very well we have, got have, have taken packages. care of some of those bills. We but, got monetary packages, and right. we also got uh, you know, this relief from buying water. Because telling people to wash their hands and not providing you know, the added, added services. And let me add one key thing that, in addition, mm. they created places where you could go fetch water if there was crisis. I mean, you know, you're in, you're in a community where you didn't have water. These are things we saw Philly Gadochi. Mm. Um, what even kills me the most? When you go to educational services, looking at the uh, sanitizers that were provided, looking at the tissues that were provided, Soap that was provided, huge amount, which just shows you some of the ways in which the monies were used, utilized, mm -hmm. primarily for the fight of COVID and the economic hardships. You know, do you know related. the problem I always have with this end of the conversation? Mm -hmm. When I spoke to uh, uh, John Kuma, no, for example, no. mm -hmm. Dr. John Kuma, uh, it's the breakdown. And, and he was referencing that the budget will not capture everything. We should go to the health ministry, for example. Th these are some of the problems that. Uh, I feel are creative because some of the things you mentioned, and we bought sanitizers and we bought PPE and we did all of these. Uh, it's the breakdown. The, the devil often I, is in the, in the detail. details. I, and and I, that is where the World Bank is taking you. But, but, but let, me, let, me, let me just quickly ask you. The, the utilities you mentioned, the water and the electricity and everything, it's supposed to have been sourced from World Bank money, what they gave us and, and the others. If we paid for them, if the World Bank paid for them, why are we having to pay for that again? Well, um, one key thing, and, and, and I need to reiterate this, that the period we had, we had, you know, the president did it for three months, and then he added more. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in as such, I don't think the one million, and you know, we get, we get hung up with dollars and cities. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the amount in USD is mm -hmm. quite small compared to, you know. Which amount lower, are you? Are you no, what I'm saying is that if when you say 33 billion, it sounds like a huge amount of money. But I mean, it's an exchange rate. You can just divide by six point something, and you'll get. And, and, I mean, and, it's, and, it's and, and in real terms, I mean, if you look at the monthly expenditure uh, for water in the whole country, mm. my goodness, I don't have the actual number, but I can imagine it's not even in a day. If you decide to pay water bills for people in this country for one day, mm. I'm sure it's a huge amount of money. Mm. And I think I'm with you. The breakdown would help all of us. But granted, we can't turn a blind eye to all the things that the president did in terms of even uh, helping some hotelies, uh, you know, some industry right. players that were really downtrodden, mm. and even companies that were also supported to, to cushion the blow of COVID. So, so these are things that hopefully even trade ministry, I'm sure, might have some answers as well. So I, I, I think in all fairness, you are very right. Uh, it's, it's appropriate that as part of being more transparent and accountable to the Ghanaian people, that we bring a, a breakdown. And, and I think uh, I'll, I'll be with you on that level. But coming back to some of the things that Suhini said, I mean, if you don't mind. Uh, just, just make it brief, because I want us to bring in the E-Levy conversation as you, as you go back. Sure, sure. So, so, so more importantly, this E-Levy, uh, program is one of the things that would have been much better in the interest of the country that the two parties showed, uh, you know, uh, commitment to. And, and, I, and I think in all of our efforts, our biggest thing is to hope that 
it becomes something that we all agree on and mm. pass. Mm. And, and not, quote unquote, it being necessarily party in government decision. Right. And, and, and that is one of the things that our men on the other side, or women on the other side, have not been able to support us. Even when we've agreed to make some minor adjustments to the uh, initial uh, uh, bill that was brought to the House. I mean, adjustments where uh, now, if I'm sending from one network to another network in my own name, I'm not charged, where salaries will not be debited, and, and all these other additional uh, concessions that have been made. And, and, and truly, in principle, I think the finance ministry has showed that he's listened, he's backed down on some things, yet none of that has even moved the opposition one bit. And these are still signals which impact the, the, the ratings, the same ratings that I'm talking about. And, and more importantly, it's unfortunate that he would say that uh, even with uh, you know, the E-Levy, we would not have had good ratings. It, it, it's not true. Right. Uh, not true. Your point is made, but for example, when you say that you're going to cut public ex expenditure by 20%, we still haven't seen that. I mean, are you waiting for a mid-year budget review? How are we going to see this as of now, as of today? That is not applicable, is it? So these are some it, it of the is, things the ratings I mean, agencies looked at. You, you've said 20% by word of mouth, but yeah. there's no documentation to back your 20%. No, the, the, so for, these for are instance, some problems the, from your end as well. The, the E-Levy bill, which now, I mean, before we, 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 we broke on Friday, clearly the opposition party does not want to even see it. Mm. Not at all read it. Right. And, and in fact... I don't know about Suhini, but a lot of the MPs on the other side that I've interacted with clearly have not even bothered to double check the contents and the adjustments that the finance minister has made. It's just they are deaf to anything that has been done. And I think that that is not a good stand, uh, you know, and a good show of trying to at least even hear us out. Okay. And, and, and that's not good. I, I'll come to you, Honorable uh, Suhini, uh, but I just want you to sneak in this bit before we move ahead, lest I forget. Uh, in, in former President Mohammed's piece that he put out, he also talks about the need for a post-COVID-19 economic recovery plan that would lay down a firm blueprint for fiscal consolidation in the face of a worsening economic situation. Why do we still not have one? We, we have one. Where is it? I mean, the... the <laughs> Let, I, I don't know if he's been... Uh, Do we have an extensive plan? Like well, he points well, to a few years ago when there was a Senchi discussion where he, he... I mean, their government, their administration invited people from even your fold to come uh, and, and dialogue with them about the way forward for the nation. Yeah, we, we have a finance minister who, one, has admitted that, you know, times are hard because of COVID. And has made adjustments. I mean, last year... I, I, am, not, I am not contesting the... No, no, the, uh, I, I'm, the I'm showing. I, I'm just saying yeah, that okay. do we have a recovery plan? That's yeah, the question. I mean, we, we, we are on a recovery, and that's what the budget... Do for we have a plan? It's not about yes. being on a recovery. Where's the plan? Yes. I mean, part of, part of it mm. is making homegrown solutions. And the finance minister has reiterated this severally, that we can't continue to depend on foreign donations. We can't continue to depend on foreign loans to do an African problem. And he's pushing for a homegrown solution. And the first step in even trying, the position says no. And how then do you then even conversate more? It's, not, it's making it difficult. Mm. Because the stand is that, hey, let's find a homegrown solution to our problem. Right. And, and, and those who are supposed to come to the table for a homegrown solution are saying no to the first move. And you know, uh, business is about signaling. If you, 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 you agree to a, a common ground to make a decision and you say you don't even come to a common ground, how then do I even, uh, you know, budge to, 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 to your side? And, and, and I think that the NDC ought to come to terms with one key thing. And I think that's one of the things that are baffling them. Listen, when you lose an election, you've lost. Right. And, and give the executive the opportunity to implement and then be held accountable. Okay. And, and that is what they are failing to do. Th thank Give you. the executive the opportunity 
and then hold them accountable. Uh, we, we, That's what we, we should do. We have this little video. If it's ready, maybe in okay. the next minute or two, I would, I would just have us um, look at it. Uh, look at it because it, it dovetails into the conversation on the e levy. But before we get to it, uh, moving away from this, so okay. that we can segue into the e levy. Uh, transport fares are set to go up by 30%. Uh, uh, we've heard from uh, Kukwa Jumandia, CEO of the oil marketing companies, who is saying that, and I've, some people have joked that uh, fuel prices per litre could break the eight. It's just a joke that is out there now. Uh, it, it's not looking good in, in that regard. But on the back of all of these, this, this could have easily been you, the NDC, in power. After all, it's more of a two-horse race when it comes to our politics. In, in their shoes, what would you have done? First of all... I mean, there's been a lot of talk. In their shoes, what would you have done with all these problems? First of all, we wouldn't have put the nation in these shoes, given the, <laughs> given the, the goodwill and then the, the, the windfalls that they enjoyed. I mean, with very little resources, we all saw how the NDC you know, uh, put the country <clears throat> back on track. At the time, we did not have three oil wells. We just had one. Mm. At the time, cocoa prices were, do, were low. Right. At the time, um, 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 oil prices skyrocketed beyond government's projections. Mm. And so we did not have all these windfalls. Our, our airports, uh, I mean, our, our term, uh, what do you call it? Uh, no, the, the, the harbors, our, our ports, our ports were not as expanded to bring in the revenue that it is bringing in. We had just started the paperless, you know, uh, thing, so we were not, we didn't get the benefits. But despite the little resources, and, and you see, I don't want it to, to even put the numbers to it, but we know the numbers, that will confuse people. I just want people to appreciate how much more this government has had by way of revenue streams, mm. raising money for them, compared to how much the NDC had to raise revenue. Mm. So definitely, if we manage the little, the way we did, to get us out of the economic woes at the time, for the international rating agencies to focus a positive outlook, if we had this more, you can only imagine that we would not have put the country into this situation. But nonetheless, we are in this situation because I believe that the NPP came into power at a very good time. It's like when you inherit a lot from your parents. Without any hard work, you don't appreciate what went into the, 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 the things you are enjoying. Really? It is only when you begin to run out of the resources that your parents twelved, you know, to mm. put at your disposal, that you begin a, a that to come angry. face to face with, 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 with reality. And I think that is what this government is faced with. Oh, oh, they, hold on just a sec, uh, Dr. Dixon. When you say a, a chest that was empty, empty. It, it is technically not correct. If it were empty, you wouldn't have had anything to run government business on. So, so well. let's, let's watch the rhetoric. It could well, not have been well, empty. Well, I didn't want I to mean, Maybe pay. it's not what you wanted, I, I but just to point out to you, it I, could not have been empty. I didn't want to pay attention to it, but we all know how much they inherited from the youth and uh, the, the, what do you call it, uh, YEA. Mm. We know how much they inherited from uh, uh, the stabilization levy, which came to their aid when Ghana had COVID. We know, we know I mean, there, there's so much now to defeat the propaganda that they inherited nothing. So I didn't even want to pay attention to what he said. I saw it as a needless destruction because the, the people of Ghana know better. But, the point, but the, point, the point has to be made that if, if we had the luck, <laughs> let me call it luck, that they had, you know, with, with, with oil prices doing well, with cocoa prices doing well. So the point is, what is the way forward? forward. Put yourself in there. Well, you interrupted they, me. In fact, they, I was going had, to the way they, forward. They've had, because yes, all I the just booms, to re, but, but I just things are not working. So how do we I just forward? needed to reiterate, reiterate the point that they have brought us to right. this point, And right. it is not automatic that if we were there, we would have been here. Now, when mm -hmm. the things were difficult, mm -hmm. and genuinely so, 
because I have already pointed to the reasons why things were difficult. Mm. Oil prices had skyrocketed, cocoa was not doing well, and all of that. And then we had the single spine salary structure that had created some imbalance in our uh, 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 expenditure and all of that. What did President Muhammad do? And that is what he is calling for. And I think sometimes that's the problem with this government. They, don't, they simply don't seem to understand governance. He called for a consensus building and created a platform, mm -hmm. the Royal saint you know, a, a, a platform, where everyone who was affected by the economy or who thought he had something to contribute to the way out was invited. Needless to say, the NPP boycotted. And up till today, Mr. Kwame Pienin I think it was, uh, yeah, Kwame Pienin uh, was, known who, who showed I said up. up till today, he's paying for it, for showing up. So they boycotted, but I can assure them that the NDC doesn't have that character. And so if they create that enabling platform, mm -hmm. they will get the cooperation needed to develop a homegrown solution. You see, they are speaking what is your as if, homegrown solution? They are speaking as if to raise 6.7 billion, the only way to do so is to pass an e-levy. What, what, what is your homegrown solution? In the form, I mean, I, I, it, it is, it, the, oh, NDC has not met, the NDC has not met now to, to, oh. to come up with a homegrown solution. So if I say so, so what I me, think... Are you, are you telling uh, me, Al-Hassan, that in the midst of all the banter on, on, on the e-levy... They don't have an alternative. That, you, you really can't... They don't have an alternative. ...expand on what the NDC's they alternatives... Don't. They don't have an alternative. ...would have been? That's all it is. You know, I've been on this set before. I was here last week. We spoke about the alternative. I told you the alternative. Tell us. We proposed on the table. Tell so me. it's unfair to say the NDC has hear. not met but those watching to come up with alternatives. No, I get you. I get you. But what the point, you see, I was developing a point when you came. I said the NDC has not met to, to, <laughs> to decide a homegrown solution that will get us out. And oh. that is not the intention of the NDC. The, NDC's, your homework intention, the NDC's intention is to get all Ghanaians at a platform well, we will all talk because we do not assume to know it all, like our homework first. in power. We are saying first. that these are some of the ideas we have. And some of the ideas start. I spoke of on this platform, even where you want to charge e-levy, maybe electronic levy. Why are you targeting transactions when there are alternatives? Why are you not targeting the fees that are charged by the mobile uh, 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 telecom operators? Why, not ta ta why are you not segregating those who are using the platform for business? The merchants, for example, because we are doing SIM registration now. So it is easy to isolate the merchants from those who use it for daily you know, activities. And perhaps on that basis, you can slap a, a tax that can be correctly identified as perhaps maybe an income tax on, 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 on those people who use it for business. Why don't you target these multilateral uh, uh, agencies like Twitter, like Facebook, like Nigeria is doing? We have, we, have, we have come to the table with all these thoughts, but we are saying that it is not enough for us to just be talking among ourselves NDC, MPP. We are saying create the enabling platform that will bring Ghanaians of all shades of opinion together Do you to have a discussion that will lead to an adoption of a homegrown solution like the NDC did. So, 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 remember, so, so, so remember, this, remember right. the NDC's homegrown solution that was adopted at Senchi was what was taken to the World Bank just for uh, policy credibility. Right. Remember, we did not even get up to one billion from the World Bank when we, I mean, the IMF, because when we joined the IMF. You're, no, you're out of idea. the intention was not to get money you're from the IMF. Idea. The intention <laughs> was to get credibility for our own program so that the IMF you know, uh, 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 acceptance of that program was going to assure the markets that this was a program the country was going to, you know, put it, 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 itself you know, you to. Know what? Oh, oh. And it gave us the results by 2016. Give, give some pause to your thoughts, uh, gentlemen, especially as we've, you know, started with the subject of the e-levy. And, and yes, I can agree with you to a certain extent that last week you, did, you made mention of some alternatives. But especially when it comes to the e-levy, yeah. and as you're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in mm -hmm. Parliament on it, I want you to contemplate what some ordinary Ghanaians feel about the e yeah. Okada riders, um, this is what they had to share. Let's, let's listen to this. Let's watch this. money. <laughs> Mesuma say ni ama wo mu. Me me di living fee am ba ma me 20 cedis no. Emu enu mu bi. E na o mu beti levy no. Ana say o mu betua levy no ama me. 
ni edi kain. Ma gather 10 10 CDs is a week. Ma 120 CDs. Me senior ma me ma me wa krasi. Me mi floaty region. Timi ma me wa hono. Me senior ma me ma me wa krasi. 120 CDs no. Ye beti afri me me 10 10 CDs na ma ka abo mu no. Enti se mi customers no a ma me ka ho a. Scanner ya me senior ma me ma me na wo twi bia no. Me ntimi nya sa kwa nya nya den. En se ni sa sika no. Mi kura moto bike ma kwa echire. Mi moto na kwa kwa nya Ford. My friend, my chama, chama, my moto, my blast tie you. Into my straw, send me scan a mental tie. Or send his guy at your film. Me kwa kwa chia scan a mani pa kwa nusu sunu. Ma send ya mani phone so. Me nusu ya chia film wa mami. Me flu wa numu ame bano ya increase me flu. Ya increase flu ano. Into scan a kebeka mention ya be twenty cedis no. Ma chia chia tax is is ama aka seventeen cedis. Ma ba beto three later. Three later, no, and drew size seventeen cities, no seventeen cities, no, I can no. Size four, no, and to me, for me, free apply one. I say, ho ho, I'm Makra. My friend, if I full process, send me hundred cities, and a hundred and fifty cities, and also your tinny panel. Me, you know, me bob with you. Me bob with you, and I made your chair tax. Me bob with you. Scan it and get your major two a month for one. Make your move your move. Me, so my ready send me piano. My tassa and yama, me chama. Chama so so no. Scan a missile sign at Chiani Kano. Ya sat is scarf from media limo. Munya dinam in Bissan and Akufado, and a doctor Mamudu Baumia. Say, say, you're not a free north, no, you're not a free eighty. Say, Baumia and say, Nisika man, I wish you a four. On it always, you can't eat beer and cano. Truck push, I will push a truck, get to scraps. You're not a year, Juma, mostly, you're not a year, Juma, or cut a business. No. And yes, sir, you are shut as one as a Juman air fool. A Juma and you are mine, Munti. Nana go for the catcher, and me say, Yet to see Castle, a common day. But one can say, Sika walk with Simi Bottom. And now I can tell me, say, Sika, I walk over for floor, Sika, will be for floor bottom, and I have a baby, and I am Yahoo since twenty seventeen. Never drew net. Yes, I can be so, sir, and can I share Oma. Anna Johnson, I said, you get your car, me a material, my sumo say. So, my meal, when I cast on my meal, who now we see one who you are da. Who wants someone's appropriate status or move out window more or be answer for your bunube? Nambu me and cana say, Tese or cut a rider be a Tese. Yeah, yeah, delivery mo be a wobble or dead yarn of four car and a cotto. Wah, over a dead yarn of four car, no cotto. Tese. Motor rider be any one more, ye be ye juma. Kwesi se, ye nina na kufa do beka, amanati as ye se, sikani ye nibi. All right, gentlemen, so uh, those are the thoughts of Sambo Kada riders. You know, and and uh, just, just before you come in, just to give a bit of, uh, because some people may not understand the local uh, parlance. So in a nutshell, th this person is saying that even for the transactions as an Okada rider or a bike, bike um, operator, for little transactions, getting paid, wanting to change a tire, wanting to repay debts. If I have to use mobile money, I'm going to be suffering losses across the board. How do I make ends meet? And in summary, that is what uh, was, was said. Uh, no, I think that... Quick one, so because I think, I, think that, I would want to hear more from Dr. Dixon uh, in, in his reaction to this. Then let him speak. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> After you. Uh, I, you know, I, I thought that I was still on the floor, so I just wanted to wrap up. You know... I think that people underestimate the, 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 the wisdom of those we consider unschooled or unlettered and those we find to be doing, you know, um, menial jobs on the street. But when you are fond of sitting at bases like I do, <laughs> you will realize that we rather are looked at as people who do not understand the economy and the country that we live in. Mm. And they have very good reasons for believing so. And listening to this gentleman, I think these are questions that are even more superior than the questions that Dr. Baumia asked the late Emisata. Dr. Baumia should be speaking to these questions. He should be answering these questions, especially on this e levy and especially so when his fascination these days is about, you know, um, um, 
digitization, digitization. digitization. It is it shocking. It feeds into the economy. It is, it? Yeah, it is shocking that in all this discussion that is ongoing, we have not had him lead the charge like he has led charges in the past when it comes to government policy. I think he should. He should let us know how this is going to improve the digitization you know, uh, 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 agenda that he's championing. He must answer the questions of right. this poor man. D Dr. Dixon, yeah. how, how do you quickly react to this? This, this is a, a, yeah. a practical breakdown yeah, yeah. Very, of what ordinary people, yeah. an Okada rider, can yeah. expect. Yeah. So, so let, me, let me make some points very clear. And, 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 and that is very important. The E-Levy has made provisions for all of this. Now, let me also add that regardless of what we do, transactions will change once we introduce e-levy in the sense that the first thing is that it is highly likely that I will pay direct to Papaye for my food uh, and, and then rather send Okada. I would not give my money to the Okada and then the Okada goes to pay. I will pay because when you pay a merchant, that pays taxes. Mm. You, you, and this is in the bill. Mm. You would not pay the 1.75. No, maybe you don't order food online. No. What no, usually no, no, no. Pe Wait, most can people I, can do I, can I, can I is that they have, they, have, they, have, they have these dispatch riders. So they call the dispatch rider and ask the dispatch rider to Uber go eats, buy the food. For instance. The only place, I, the I, only, I, no, the only, no, no, maybe you don't sec. order online. I'm just trying to explain you know, to you. Just a no, sec. Uber, I, I, you still I, agree. I, I, I want you to agree. You I mean, there are different dimensions what? to yes. back, back quickly yeah. because he those, those who do it, there are two options online. So you can either buy directly from Papaye and Papaye will get a, a delivery. They, have, they, they will provide a delivery service, which you will pay for. Mm. That is where you will pay the merchant, you will pay through the merchant, and also pay the delivery through the merchant. Right. But most people I know rather prefer to have these dispatch riders. They keep the dispatch riders on their, on their phones. Mm. That's what I'm saying. When you don't sit at the base, no, right. you don't know so, what so, happens. So let me make it a point now. Now, Thank you. it is highly likely with the introduction of the e-levy that dispatch riders will then now have a merchant account because it's business. And if they are paying taxes to the to the country, the 1.75 will not apply to them because that is, that is part of the bill. Right. Merchants who pay taxes will not then be double charged. Mm. And, and, and that is why that this Okada rider, let me put it that way, and, and mind you, the first degree holders who are doing uh, you know, Uber and all these things. So don't assume that all Okada riders, I mean, you were I trying said, to say that. Said, no, he's suggesting that not and some of those unlettered who are okay. and, we, and we doing minimal that. jobs. Uh -huh. It doesn't so, mean so, you, so then yeah. we're on the same yeah. page. Right. Right. Jobs. So, right. so the key thing is that with the introduction of the e-levy, mm -hmm. I mean, merchant to merchant transactions, even now, do not have some, some charges. If, if, you know, you go and you, use, you, you do the, the appropriate uh, transaction through a merchant uh, account. So in a nutshell, uh, this, this will make some changes to how people transact. Mm. And one of the key things, even if you're going to do through your Okada rider, this Okada rider will now have what is appropriate, an appropriate merchant account, which would be making the needed, and, and this shows you how we expand the tax net. But, but do you get a feel, just, just to level up on this, yeah. do you get a feel of how uh, an ordinary person could be bombarded from different angles in terms of, let's say, I, I, you lend me money, I borrow from you, mm -hmm. you pay, you send me via mobile, and I do that sometimes. Yeah. You know, people are not, you know, lending them the money, but sometimes you have to, there are people here and there that, oh, Charlie, they, they, you have to send them money. The person is going to withdraw, of course, if, if, it, if it goes past the cap, they are going to face some penalties or, or the levy will be taken. Uh, someone is, when you're going to repay the debt, of course, you have to pay up to, what, what you took, minus, not, not minus the, the, the charges in there. All of these transactions, I mean, are you imagining how people could be hit with this from different angles? Maybe the, the Okada rider, it may not follow through like that because some things may change. Maybe you will pay with cash and all of that. But are you looking at how the ordinary Ghanaian could no, it will, suffer the impact? It will impact, impact us, and, and, I mean, and, regardless. And... and, and what it is is that our, our lifestyles will change one way or the other uh, because... And, and the lifestyles could change in the sense that I may, you know, wanting to avoid too much of this, decide to go cash, 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 and, and that in itself and, 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 and would not really to, you know, the benefit I, of our economy, would it? I really think that, listen, 
Uh, for instance, if I'm doing a transaction with another company in Kumasi, and it's a merchant merchant transaction, that 1.75 right away is not there. And, and that is what we need to communicate to the Ghanaian people. Mm. That is what's in the bill. Is that what you're failing to communicate to the Ghanaian no, people? We are doing our, our, our bit, but then... Uh, they are throwing sand in your Gary. They are throwing sand in your Gary. One thing I heard on one of your shows, for instance, was the fact that they were saying that if you, if you are paid uh, salary through mobile money, you'll be deducted. And that is not true. Right. You know, so these are the things that are hurting the e-bill, in the e-levy, e in, in the sense that you know, they, they are not being forthright and truthful with the Ghanaian people. Because okay. provisions have been made to make sure that you know, uh, the, the, the things go smoothly and you are not double charged. And, and, and I really think that uh, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I want double, us to spend yeah. a few minutes talking about the UTAG impasse, uh, but before maybe some five, six minutes. Before, but, but before, you know, before, before we get into that, I just want to find out. So as you go back to Parliament, uh, right now we're unsure whether it's going to be Friday when the E levy will be tabled again. And, and that in itself is a bit of a. Uh, uh, I, should I say, a practice that is not necessarily the norm in Parliament. We should know when exactly it's going to be tabled on the floor of Parliament, but now it's a bit sketchy. We, we're in a situation where our speaker is not in the country. You have deputy speakers. We have, and, and, and that brings, the, you know, the unfortunate statement that, you know, Asidun Kitya made. That, About the slap? You know, very unfortunate. For, and for somebody who's on the board, of Parliament, I really think that he should be. It's as if that is what uh, it will know, take uh, to ensure that the right things are done. If Parliament any deputy is, speaker attempts to bring that person, should be slapped. Ideas and the, the rule of law starts from there. We are legislators, and it's unfortunate that a board member who's supposed to be adversarial and advising us appropriately should say that in public. And I really okay. think that if 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 I was him, I would resign. Can you, that, can that's you, the right thing to Are you do. sure that next time the e-levy is tabled, you'll be able to muster the numbers to, to get it? I mean, we've heard talk of, and, and we don't know how true this is, but even some members of parliament pushing for certain roles before they join you to vote. And I don't want to mention we, we We wish to have an e-levy where the NDC is with us. Will you be able to muster the numbers good. to get it? Well, the numbers a, a are there. We have our numbers. Okay. But the thing is, you know, it comes back to one key thing. Without a speaker, it will be 137 on each. Mm. And that, that breaks the deal. Okay. I mean, without the speaker. Because these guys are vent on Al-Hazan. how many uh, people. Uh, if, so, some 30 you know, seconds just. I noticed track. you wanted to say something. Okay. So, we, we just talk briefly see, about I it. Just, I, just, I just think that what you are speaking to was not addressing the concern of the Okada rider, rider, especially in relation to when he says that I work so hard, I mobilize 10 Ghana cities for a period of time you know, uh, totaling 120 Ghana cities. It's and only your 100, and, could, I decide, could you just allow and I decide to send it to my mother, 120 Ghana cities who is in the village. Mm. How appropriate is it for that 120 Ghana cities to attract? Technically, it's not the 120, it's the 20 cities or yeah. the above. Yeah. It's not the whole 120 yeah. cities that will be affected. So he can do 90 today, 30 tomorrow. He's just saying, why should he work so hard? Save 10 Ghana, 10 Ghana, 10 Ghana. Mm. Then maybe in a week or two, he raises 120. Mm. And that attracts a tax. That yeah. because he's just sending it to it his won't. mother. Who it is won't. sick. You have not... So, so on the floor of now, Parliament... Now, 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 when he talks about misinformation mm. on the bill, let us be clear that the misinformation started from the Minister of Finance. When the minister was saying one thing, his deputies were saying different things. After the uh, 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 passage, I mean, after the passage, yes, of the appropriation bill, remember that these clarifications, some of these clarifications, which still do not address all the questions raised that you point to in the bill, came later. The bill came to the House after we had passed appropriation. Right. But before the bill was brought to the House, nobody really knew what it was going to cover and what it was not going so to cover. So now that you know. And that is why even the deputies at the Ministry of Finance were contradicting each other. Now that we know, Are nobody I know on our side has spoken to the, to the exemptions and the areas that are excluded. Oh. But we still continue to raise the issues that we think the bill, you know, uh, still doesn't address. Okay. The issues like the Okada uh, riders, what are we taxing? What kind of tax is it? 
Because we know what our tax so this conversation are. definitely, is it a direct definitely tax? will be. Is it an indirect tax? Uh, what are we taxing? Are we taxing income? Are we taxing income? This, we taxing this, capital? this e levy. Those are the questions that are still not being asked. This e levy conversation I mean, definitely will continue on the floor of parliament. But I don't want to. It would be remiss on my part to let go of you uh, without delving into the U tag bit. In two minutes, one minute each, your summary comments. I want you to focus that on U tag. And the situation as it stands now, yesterday there, were, there was supposed to have been a, a, a meeting with the employer, government, and UTAG, the employee, with the NLC in the middle, arbitrating. UTAG boycotted that, that event. They didn't attend. And we know that some institutions like the UCC have those clauses in their uh, books when it comes to 21 days and shutting down and all of that. One minute each, please. One minute. 40 seconds if you can. What's the way forward? Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Dixon, the way forward. Well, uh, what, one thing is unfortunate. I, I, I personally don't like strikes. I really think that uh, they should be at the table discussing. Not being at the table won't help us at all. And I also would plead that we come to a realization that times really are tough. Uh, you know, regardless of uh, what the opposition might be saying or whoever might be saying, times really are tough. And, and I think that uh, we are still better off as a nation than where we were before, uh, and in the sense that the government has their, you know, best of, of, of minds working on this to, to, to help us. But okay. money is hard to come by, okay. and, and I really think that they should be considerate of, of government. I mean, this is, our, our current situation is not very favorable. They should be considerate of government. Well, I'm sure um, he meant to say regardless of what people in government are saying, times are hard, because that's what we have been saying all along, that times are hard. So if you say regardless of what the opposition is saying, mm -hmm. I don't really know what you meant. But regardless of what some people in government, either than yourself, may be saying, you agree with majority of Ghanaians that times are hard. And there is no debate on that. I just think that um, UTAC has shown a lot of magnanimity over the period, because this issue they are striking over have been you know, uh, in the works for a very long time now. They have shown and demonstrated, you know, in my view, enough understanding and right. tolerance. And I believe that it will be in our interest as a nation for government to at least meet them halfway and persuade them, use okay. language that is persuasive right. uh, to get them back to their classroom. Instead right. of, you know, um, the approach that I have seen so far where uh, the NLC as usual, will always uh, 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 declare one side as being wrong. And right. mostly it is not the government side that is wrong. It's always the agitating parties that are wrong. I think once you do that consistently and you, you fail to get collaboration from the agitating parties, you only have yourself uh, to blame. And okay. we have also heard from the leadership of UTAC how, for example, the finance minister and you know, some other members in government have treated them in the past. Mm -hmm. That has entrenched their positions. And okay. if we have time, All I would right. have gone into you know, some Unfortunately, of the we don't. Also you, you've done way over happened, one minute. You know, but, with but. regards to this e levy and how cooperation is difficult in parliament. Gentlemen, we are grateful that you always join us. Dr. Uh, Dixon Adomako Kisi, Member of Parliament, Anyasu Uton. Thank you so much for coming, doing us the honors. And uh, Hassan Suini, Member of Parliament, Tamandu North. Uh, thank you as well for joining well, the conversation. Well, we've set the pace for the conversation that comes up next, uh, our next uh, big story. It has to do with the University uh, of Health and Allied uh, Sciences. And they are 10 years already. What has been their impact in terms of national life? And beyond that, uh, how do they react to the UTAG uh, saga? All of that up next after the break. Stay. So without further ado, we have Professor John Japong, uh, Vice Chancellor of the University for Health and Allied Sciences, joining the conversation. It's all about two crucial matters, 10 years of UHAS. What has been the impact of this institution on our national life? He'll be telling us about that. But before we uh, get into that, we'll also talk about the UTAC situation, which has become hugely problematic. And, that, and the last bit I was talking about, UTAC failing to uh, attend that uh, you know, meeting 
convoked by the National Labour Commission. Uh, our guest this morning on the second belt, Professor John Japo. Thank you so much for joining the conversation, Prof. Thank you so much for having me. Mm. Uh, so even before we get into the UTAG bit, I just want to go back and forth a bit. Uh, six years at post, right? Yes, this is my sixth year. Mm. And 10 years overall uh, as, as a, an institution. Yeah. Uh, what has the journey been like? Oh, I think the U.S. journey has been uh, a good one overall. Um, difficult beginnings, but uh, by and large, I think uh, we are impacting the country the way we ought to. I mean, we started as a university, actually, uh, the Act of Parliament that established the university was passed in December 2011. And the university started its operations in uh, September 2012 with just 154 students. Today, we are over 7,000 in all, mm -hmm. including regular students and uh, sandwich students. So uh, I think it's been a good journey uh, mm -hmm. overall. Of course, with these challenges, uh, which is, is expected in the current tertiary education landscape. Right. Uh, yep. And you are a specialized university. Yes, we are a specialized university. Health and allied we sciences. focus on health and allied sciences. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think one of the major challenges that uh, many institutions have had in the past has been what we describe as machine creep. So mm -hmm. you set up as a university of uh, science and technology, and then eventually you find out that... Uh, You're doing oh, all sorts oh, of things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and not just doing all sorts of things, and then uh, you find out about 60% of your student population are doing the humanities. Uh, it's a challenge. We are determined to be focused on the health and allied sciences. But that comes with the challenges because you see, financing tertiary education these days is a, is a, is a big issue. Mm. And the sciences and engineering in particular are very expensive. So in order to break even, you would want to mix with the humanities, which is not usually as expensive as the the sciences, right. that is if you don't have the, the necessary core funding. Uh, so that is, that is a dilemma in which we find ourselves. We've been tempted a few times, but uh, we've decided to remain focused on our mission. Okay. Uh, let's now get to the, the UTAC situation, University Teachers Association of Ghana. Like I said, after we've dealt with that, we'll come back to the 10th anniversary. Yeah. Of, of, uh, how do you feel about all of this, the developments, um, and, and, and this extended strike. I mean, this is the first time in a while that we've had such an extended strike. What do you make of it? Well, I, I think it's, it's uh, unfortunate that we've come to this point. But before I continue, I think uh, <clears throat> I need to make a few disclaimers. <laughs> that I, I am a member of UTAC by virtue right. of being right. a university lecturer. And, and we're fully aware. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. And then also as... Uh, the vice chancellor appointed by the university council on behalf of government to manage the university. Mm. Sometimes I'm also seen on being there on the other side. Right. So <clears throat> it's been an issue of trying to thread cautiously to try and manage the situation. Mm. But having said it all, nobody wants a strike on their hands. Nobody wants such an impasse on their hands because eventually it affects students it affects the, the parents of students, and it affects the, the general population. And uh, even the faculty, the lecturers themselves, uh, don't enjoy it. I mean, I, I don't think anybody is enjoying what is going on. Uh, I think it is an issue which uh, we need to try and deal with as quickly as possible. In terms of this strike, it has brought academic you know, work to practically a standstill. Yeah. Um, uh, some students have even left you know, their institutions for home, as, as we know it. And we've had different organizations speak to it. Uh, NOOCS has spoken to it. USAG, has USAG is actually embarking on a demonstration that they, <clears throat> they, they are planning on hitting the streets and all of that. The conditions of service we are speaking of, I mean, some of them go as far back as single spine in 2013, then the 2019 reliefs and all of that. And then last year's petitions that, you know, 
the jaw jawing that did not see the light of day, which has culminated in, in all of this. Uh, have you been hard done as an association? Have you been hard done? You've, you've gone to the negotiating table a number of times, but your, your requirements have simply not been met. Have you been hard done? I think I, I would rather not get into the details of whether one has been hard done mm -hmm. or not. Uh, in the first place, I don't speak on behalf of UTAG. Right. Uh, but you're a crucial but, player as but, vice chancellor of yes, the, the, yes, the institutions. Yes, yes. I, I, I accept that as, as a very key player in the field. Mm. And uh, as to people embarking upon strikes and students going on strikes and all that, yeah, I think, I think that is the rights of, of every institution or everybody and all that. But uh, eventually, that is not what is going to solve the problem. And uh, we need to sit around the table and talk. Mm. And Vice Chancellor Ghana has been doing this uh, all the while. Uh, indeed, in the strike that occurred last year, uh, Vice Chancellor Ghana was at a, I mean, seat around the table to basically facilitate all the agreements that we had. And uh, we continue to do that from the background and uh, talk to government, talk to, uh, to UTAG to ensure that there is peace and harmony. I think that that is all I want to say as to whether one has been hard done or not, I, I wouldn't get into, into those, those, those details. Because as, as you earlier alluded to, uh, yesterday, uh, following the court decision, NLC called for right. uh, a meeting. And uh, we are told that UTAG did not honor the meeting because, as they've always put it, they don't trust the right. NLC. <clears throat> Through its lawyer, it, it, it yeah. made it clear that it, was, yeah. it wasn't going to be there. Yeah. So, so Vice Chancellor Ghana is working uh, <laughs> behind the scenes to try and facilitate a discussion. Even as you work behind the scenes, yeah. is that a, I mean, the, the stance adopted by UTAG, are you supportive of it? You, you just said one thing, we need to sit and talk. Yes. Uh, the NLC invited you to sit and talk. And uh, UTAG, I know you don't speak for UTAG, but yeah. UTAG, of which you're a member, yeah. decided we don't want to talk. Do, do you feel that was not in the best interest of all parties, including the students who are suffering? Well, the, the NLC did not invite the students. They invited UTAG, the, the NEC, the National Executive Committee, right. of which I'm not a member. Right. Uh, but I can tell you for a fact that uh, this afternoon, uh, Vice Chancellor's Ghana, UTAG, and uh, the employer uh, are going to have a meeting. Mm. So all is not lost. I, I sincerely believe that once we sit around the table, uh, there will be some give and take, and then we, we move on. We all want to put this behind us. So um, without, without saying too much, <laughs> that is all I can say. So you vice chancellors are meeting, but, but there's not going to be, I, I mean, this is not with government, this is not with, so how, how, no, no, why, why no, do you think, or, no, is it, or is it a broader no, meeting? No, it is a meeting, let, let, let's say the meeting that in a way NLC was trying to call, which UTAG refused to attend. Mm. Uh, Vice Chancellors Ghana and government and UTAG are going to sit around the table uh, this afternoon. Okay, so, so basically what failed to happen yesterday is going to happen today? Without NLC. Without the NLC? Yes. Why? Is it because the NLC is a problem? I, I, I don't want to get into that. As I said, I don't speak for UTAG and I've never engaged NLC in recent times. But I believe that the court said that the employer and the employees should talk right. as to whether it is facilitated by NLC or facilitated by Vice Chancellor Vice Ghana. Ghana. I think at the end of the day, we want a solution. So let's, let's leave it as that. Are, are all of you going to be there, the Vice Chancellors? I mean, is that the, the agreement? We, we had hoped so, but uh, as you know, there are 16 of us now and we are right. scattered all over the country. Mm. So not everybody would be uh, present, but there are some core members of the negotiating table who, who would be around the table. 
or at least a, a core group that would be able to represent the entirety yes, yes. of or yeah. form a quorum. Yeah. Uh, how hopeful are you that today's uh, meeting will you yield the, the the results that most people in the country want? Look, we also in the 90s, especially when strike this, strike that, and students and no one wants this. It affects the academic calendar. People are paying money. They are not getting what they 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 bargain for. I mean, how, how quickly do you think? today's meeting could resolve this? I, I can only be hopeful. Mm. I can only be hopeful. I mean, I don't have any assurances from UTAG, I don't have any assurances from government, but there is nothing in this world, there is no problem, as the accounts will say, that has come that we've used a knife to, to as it were, divide it or right. whatever. Right. We need to sit down and talk. Mm. And once we've agreed to sit down and talk, I think we will hopefully make some progress. And uh, I can only hope, because you see, all of us want a solution. I think that is the that that is that is the, the a common uh, scenario amongst us. We all want a solution to the problem. Uh, we may have different aspirations and uh, hope that certain things would come our way, but in negotiations, it's an issue of give and take. So I, I pray and hope that this afternoon we'll be able to, to get by in, in, in trying to arrive at some conclusion. Because otherwise, you see, some students, I think for those who have been on KNU University campus, they've been there for almost four weeks now. Uh, some universities have been open for three weeks. Others have been open for two weeks. Mm. We cannot continue to keep our students on campus sitting down, doing nothing, and uh, spending the little money that has been given to right. them by their parents and all that. So, we need to have a solution to this. But, uh, how, just give us a fair reflection of how this has panned out on your campus, the University for Health and Allied Sciences, how, how it has reflected on students and, and student life, basically, teaching. I think it's very similar to what happens on other campuses. You know, in the past, I, I mean, I, I studied in KNUSD and I worked in Legon before moving to, to UHAS. In the past, when these strikes occurred. Uh, the medical students and the health sciences were allowed to have their way in, in, in some way. I mean, the, yeah. because the teaching would happen in maybe in Kolebu or Konfanochi, the other faculty turned a blind eye. And especially also because the program of the medical students was an all year round thing. So they tended to turn a blind eye on it. But this time, it hasn't been the case. And for us, our main focus is health and allied sciences. So it's like everybody yeah. needs attention. And uh, so everybody is sitting in their hostels doing some private studies and uh, just walking around. And it's not good for uh, the country, it's not good for the economy, and it's not good for anybody at all. So we need to get over this. Uh, the 21-day rule, just to wrap so that we can move on to you has proper and your 10th anniversary. Mm. The 21-day rule where so, some uh, say after 21 days, schools shut down and all of that. Uh, some institutions have that, you know, in, in their statutes, if you like. Do you have that at you has? We don't. And uh, I'm not aware... Of any institution because I, I I know I mean the other day we were speaking to Dr. Bert Bwedikusi, okay. uh, who is president of UTAG at UCC, okay. and he mentioned that they, for example, have it. Some institutions do. Not all of the sixteen institutions have them, but there seems to be this um, unwritten rule, more, more or less. Some in written form, others in unwritten form, where after twenty-one days you shut down. Okay. Do you have that? And if you don't, no. uh, is there any anticipation that? When I mean, I, I think we've hit the 21 days. We, we, Is there we, going to be a shutdown? We don't have it. And I, I came out of Legon. Mm. As far as I know, I think I know the Legon statutes very well. Legon doesn't have it. Mm. Uh, you know, there are some regulations on the management of students' academic work and things like that. For instance, there is, uh, I can't recall exactly what it says, but in the student's handbook, there will be something to the effect that if students uh, miss lectures for 21 days. Yes. Yeah. So I think in some way, that is what some people are interpreting mm. on the other hand. So that well, well, the UCC one, one is uh, very clear. I oh. think it's kind of I, I, I because Dr. Because he said it. I haven't but seen so it. In, in the other context, this could it. be what would be I, used I, or referenced. I haven't it. seen it. Right. 
But you see, if they say if students absent themselves, the students haven't absented themselves. Right. So uh, it's, 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 it's a different thing altogether. Mm. Assuming that was what one was referring to, the students haven't absented themselves. Mm. Let's get back to the University for Health and Allied Sciences. Ten yes. years on, um, yes. six years at post. You are in your sixth year. So the sixth, sixth and last year. year. Sixth and last year. Yes. Uh, you're not hoping to, or your constitution does not allow you to, to go further. Oh, my, by, by statutes, I'll turn 60 this year. So, oh, right. Uh, right. I, I, your, gray, I, your gray hairs are counting. So <laughs> I, I, I it's have, time for you to rest your body. I have to retire by, by law. Uh, but, but I know there are instances where, I mean, some of you can be commissioned based on your expertise and all of that so that you can stay on for a while. Is that not something you're looking forward to? Oh, no, 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 no not at all. I, I think that uh, it's, it's time for other people to also come and demonstrate what they can bring on board. Um, we had a first, the Foundation Vice Chancellor, Professor Binka, who was there for four years, and uh, the lot fell on me to continue. I believe there are many other uh better people out there and if there is a need for us to to support them we will do so right yeah. yeah there are so many of you i mean quite a number of you 16 of you the these public institutions and all of that and and myriad uh private institutions of higher learning yeah. what would you say has been the contribution of you has to our national life over these last 10 years <clears throat> i think our major contribution, of course, has been in the area of uh, human capacity for the for our healthcare delivery. Mm. We have contributed very significantly. If you look at the way the university is structured, <clears throat> the actually currently there are only two universities, as far as I recall, whose mandate uh, are very clearly stated in the Act of Parliament that establishes them. Mm. as the University of Health and Allied Sciences and the University of Energy and Natural Resources. Indeed, when you talk about UHAS, the Act says that we shall have eight schools and three institutes. And the eight schools are our School of Medicine, School of Pharmacy, School of Basic and Biomedical Sciences, uh, Public Health, uh, Dentistry, uh, Nursing and Midwifery, uh, which other one have I missed? They will kill me for missing, <laughs> <laughs> for missing the I know eighth. it can get confusing very quickly. <laughs> I like health sciences. Okay. And there is an eighth one which I can't remember often. It, it would be tricky to get all of them, uh, you know. Yeah. But, but of course, we but, know there are yes. eight of them. Yeah, there, there, there are eight schools. And we, are, and we are training all the health professionals that the country needs. Mm. But beyond that, beyond training people from the senior high schools, right. we are also helping in upgrading the skills of many, many, many more uh, health professionals who need top ups for their, for, their, for their skills and qualifications and all that. You know, we all go through different pathways as far as our education is concerned. Not everybody gets the opportunity to go from uh, secondary school into university immediately. Some, uh, by virtue of fate and other challenges that may come their way, they end up doing some diploma programs and things like that. But it doesn't mean they cannot do degree programs. So over the last couple of years, we have embarked upon a, a program, a sandwich program, right. which trains many nurses and other health professionals. And I can tell you that our place is a place of choice as far as the the, the sandwich programs are concerned. We currently have over 3,000 sandwich students who, mm. who come to us at specific times to get their skills upgraded in nursing, midwifery, public health nursing, the allied health sciences, disease control officers, epidemiology, field technicians, all of them. They come over health information technology people. They all come and we upgrade their skills to the degree and some have even come back to do their, their masters, right. which, which is very, very impressive. So we, we believe in not leaving anybody behind. And for that reason, we have impacted, I mean, the health, the health uh, sector very, very significantly. Mm. We <clears throat> had our 
our first batch of doctors uh, produced two years ago. Right. And of course, uh, 10 years. So you look at about a seven to eight year window. Yeah, we actually are, are, are medical students. When, when we started our school of medicine, we didn't start with the MBCHB program immediately. Right. Yeah. So they lagged behind a bit. I think the second or third year, then we started our, our, our medicine program. Uh, so we graduated our first batch, and now we've graduated, actually we've graduated two batches. Mm. And uh, if you speak to the Medical and Dental Council and uh, our regulators, they were overwhelmed with the quality of products that we have from UHAS. They were completely overwhelmed. How many again? How many were they? Well, the first batch was, I think, 45 or thereabout. Mm. And the second batch is also around 50 or thereabout. Right. So, so, this, so we have, this, so we have about space of time. You've, you've produced about at least 100, 100 doctors, doctors yeah. for, for Ghana. Yes. And not just doctors. I mean, we have our first batch of uh, PharmD students. That is a pharmacy program which runs for six years. Mm. They will be graduating this year. Mm. Uh, I mean, our pharmacy program also started uh, just about six years ago. You know, so, and then, but beyond that, the nurses and midwives and public health nurses and allied health scientists and by allied health scientists I'm referring to, physiotherapists, laboratory, um, um, medical laboratory scientists, um, dietetics students, and uh, uh, people who uh, train in health, uh, sorry, uh, are here in sciences. I mean, there's so many of them. Mm. Now we've started a program on orthotics and prosthetics. Oh, wow. Yes. The, the, the only program you can find in Sub-Saharan Africa. Wow, prosthetics. Yes. yes. Because it, it, it's also a very expensive area to go into. Prosthetics don't come cheap. Yes. Now we also started, ah, and now the school I forgot was the uh, school of sports and sports exercise. exercise. Uh, in <laughs> fact, I'm looking at the list here. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned uh, basic and biomedical sciences, yes. allied health sciences, yes. nursing and midwifery, yes. public health, yes. pharmacy, yes. school of medicine, yeah. school of sports and exercise yes. medicine. And of course, there's also the basic school, which yeah, I'll be that, talking to you about. Oh, oh okay. Right. All right. So, so now, now we have programs in uh, sports and exercise medicine. Mm. Uh, and it, it's, it's amazing the way the students are engaging with the National Sports Council, or is it now National Sports Authority? Yeah. Working with them towards uh, 2023. What is 2023? Uh, the uh, All African Games. Mm. Uh, our school is partnering the National Sports Authority for the, the All African Games. I see. So we, we are impacting the, the, the country in a very in interesting way. I see you spoke about institutes as well, the Institute of Health Research, Institute of Traditional and Alternative Medicine, and you have centers and directorates yes. as well. Yes. Too many to yeah. uh, even uh, count. So quite, quite impressive uh, what you've done uh, so far. You are one of the youngest public universities in, in Ghana. Yes. And, and you're making quite some strides. So before we, we look at some of the things that you'll be doing with it, uh, as you mark this anniversary, mm -hmm. uh, we also notice that KNUSD, uh, uh, Legon, others, they have basic schools. You yes. seem to be following that route. I think you had your first graduation recently. Yes, uh, our basic school is something which <laughs> I was pushed into, into putting in place. Uh, didn't you want to do it? No, not that I didn't want to do it. But you know, when you have a limited pot of money, you want to focus on your core business. But when your faculty are not happy with the quality of schools in your environment and they want the typical university primary, mm. you can't overlook it. So after a lot of thinking through, we decided that we'll bite the bullet. It costs us a bit of money uh, because we like to do things good. Mm. Our, our basic school is probably the best basic school you can find in the country. Mm. Yes, I can assure you of that. By I mean, after one year, you're making those... Oh, by, I'm, I'm referring to by way of infrastructure. Okay. By way of infrastructure, it's, it's probably the best you can find around. Mm. So we've done a lot of investment. And that attracts the best quality. Mm. You know, because, you see, you may have somebody... Uh, let me take a... a a specialized field, like maybe cardiothoracic surgeries. You, you want a cardiothoracic surgeon to move to Ho to come and work in your university. And he says, well, my children go to school at, uh, which one shall I refer to? Say, 
Northridge Lyceum or uh, Christ the King or Morning Star. Will I get a school like that there? Mm. Uh, I mean, the basic schools in Hull are good, but I am not sure they are of that quality. That so, they are. so this is of a very high standard? Very high standard, you know. So we have to invest in it, and that, that is bringing in a lot more people uh, who feel committed. Let me just go back to the Utah conversation briefly, and it's because you made mention of that small pot of money yep. that you have as an yep. institution. Yep. I recall a uh, mention was made, and I've forgotten who exactly, uh, I don't know whether it was Professor Jampo, so I'm being careful here, yep. uh, said that uh, if you were given certain leverage when it comes to the funds you generate and all of that in terms of their use as public institutions, then you could even take care of uh, some of these, uh, <laughs> not emoluments, but uh, allowances. allowances and others that, you know, the employer government is struggling with. It just hit me. Uh, wh what do you think of that? Now that you talk of your limited pool of money, is that something you subscribe to? Uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a long discussion. This started... What is the short of it? Well, well, well let, let, me, let, let me explain. Because, you see, when you have student population of regular students, 4,500, your overheads are so small mm. compared to the University of Ghana, which may have about 80,000. Tens 000. of thousands. KNUS, which may have maybe now close to 100,000. I don't know the exact numbers. Winneba and UCC, around 80,000 there about. They can talk that way. Mm. If that is in terms of wanting to use, use given the leeways, yes, they can use their funds yes. for that. So assuming that there was even uh, 200 CDs overhead, that comes from every fees that is paid. There are huge numbers there. But if you take a uh, place, you have. If you take UMAT in, in, yeah. in Takwa, and technology. Yeah, and then UNER. We are all doing around 6,000 there. But so it, it doesn't, it, it's a drop in the ocean. So it can be a good policy, but government will have to continue to support the smaller universities. Sorry. Actually, there was a point in time, I think it was in 2015 or 2016 thereabout, where there was a discussion of, of weaning off some of the bigger universities mm. to operate like GIMPA. I mean, in all this strike, you haven't heard of GIMPA. No. Nope. GIMPA is running. Yeah. Because uh, they get some small subvention from government, they are allowed to manage their resources and all that. So we, we, need, we need to balance that. And if we went that way also, we should also be willing to allow the free markets to operate. Right. So if you say I should pay my lecturers or give them the necessary allowances, then you can't tell me that for medicine, which everybody knows the private universities around are charging around $12,000 thereabout. Right. And you'd say that I should charge 2,000 CDs. So that would have to change. That would have to change. Right. Then you talk about uh, the inequities and the inequalities and people not having the opportunity to access uh, some of these uh, institutions. Then we must put in place the necessary uh, granting system mm. so that nobody is left behind irrespective of their financial status and their ability to pay. Right. It, it, it is feasible, but... We need to think through it very carefully. So it's the long haul. Yes. Uh, if you can manage this in a minute and a half, tell us about what we can expect as you uh, mark your 10th anniversary. <clears throat> you have an entire program. Yes. What are some of the things you're looking at this year? Well, we, we want to, uh, for want of a better phrase, uh, make the right noises for people to know that we are there and we are impacting society. Mm. And we want to start with our immediate environs. We have a campus in Hohoi. In Ho. The bigger campus is in Ho, but we have a campus in Hohoi. The School of Public Health is based in Hohoi. Mm. So we want to engage the community right. with all our health programs and screening of, 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 uh, of, of, of the community for uh, basic ailments and community education on health to, to let them feel our presence mm. and facilitate further health-seeking behavior. Mm. Uh, because you cannot be a University of Health and Allied Sciences in Hohoi and not impact on the community. Uh, we think that is, the, that is the first key goal that we want to achieve. Right. And we are doing this through many 
community engagement uh, programs and activities, which have all uh, been lined up. Right. At the end of the, the period, we intend to have a, a deba with the fanfare to get everybody uh, involved. Right. But also to bring to the need, I mean, so to the knowledge of the community and to government in particular, that with so little, this is what we've been able to achieve. Mm. And that if we're given more resources, especially by way of infrastructure, mm. we could impact this country very significantly. Because you see, I, I, I feel very sad when we do our admissions every year, and we've just gone through an admission cycle, where people with very good grades are unable to access programs of their choice. You know, I mean, uh, I, I went to medical school with aggregate nine in 1980. Mm. Uh, now, if you have aggregate nine, you will not access. Even with a six, the ones count and all, the A's and all of yes. that, and you may not make you it. You may not make it. Right. You see, so you see many people coming in to do other programs which are not of their choice. And uh, they go through their programs with a lot of uh, very little enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. they, are just, they are just going through it as if it going was a right route. Right, yes, as a rite of passage. You see, right. Because all these things have implications. Mm -hmm. We've now managed to increase our, our class sizes by about 20% mm -hmm. in all, 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 all around. But the real determining step is the size of our teaching hospital. Right. A teaching hospital is a small teaching hospital. So if you have 100 medical students, if you have 300 nursing students, mm. and you have 100 pharmacy students and allied health scientists, they will be milling around the... <laughs> and that itself has consequences. Has we, we, we have to go, but I, I just want to do this. It, it, just give me a yes or no answer, if possible. Yeah. Uh, Professor Avoke of the UEW, is he a friend of yours, and how do you feel about his reinstatement? Oh, he's, he's a very good friend of mine. Mm. Very, very good friend of mine. Mm. How do you feel I, about when, his when I When I came into office, he had been in office for a year. How do you feel about the reinstatement? Well, we I... We have to go, so... Just yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think... The, the right thing has been done. Mm. If, if wrongs are, are corrected, right. it, it, is, it is in the right direction. Prof. Yadawase. Akwe. Thank Akwe. you so much for joining the conversation. And we look forward to many more great things from you, Has. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I want to thank Multimedia for giving us the opportunity. I right. hope there will be many more opportunities to tell Hopefully the, so. the, 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 the UHAS story. The UHAS around. story. Yeah. Well, uh, we have to go. Professor John uh, uh, Japon joining the conversation this morning, uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Health and Allied Sciences. Once more, we're very grateful, sir. Thank you. And that is how we draw the curtains on the AM show for another morning. Don't you forget, at 10 and at noon, we bring you our major news bulletins. And we'll be back tomorrow with the AM show. <laughs>